Whoa, look at you. <laughs> Rocky Balboa. That's what Rocky Balboa does. <laughs> What? Is that what he does? I don't know. I don't know. It's like a show of strength, I guess. That's I don't know. what it's I do I all the time. I haven't seen any Rocky anything. Show off my strength. I've seen the scene of him running up the stairs. That's a thing. And I've seen him drinking the egg. That's it. It's oh, literally... you saw the egg? Yeah. Oh, interesting. That yeah. was from that. He just did that in the first one. And I believe there were six. Yuck. A lot of egg. That's do you, not do you good for drink you. or eat an egg? If you're doing it like that, yeah. then you're drinking. Drinking. If you're not chewing, you're drinking. <laughs> Wise words. Whatever, whatever it is. Wise words from Franklin. <laughs> yeah, you don't eat a smoothie. You don't eat a milkshake. No, but egg, eggs are not liquid. Well, they are in that form. Not the yolks. Yeah, it's liquid. The yolks are not a liquid. It's more liquid than solid. Mm. If you don't have to chew The whites it, are definitely liquid. The yolks... No, I guess you don't chew them. Yeah, All right. Stuff. Ready to do this? Um, I yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You got a jacket on and everything? Are you like? I'm a little chilly you today. Stay around for a while or I'm what? Just a little here? chilly. All right, that's fine. It's not. It's, fine. it's not. It's kind of a dreary, <clears throat> chilly it day. It is a dreary day. It's yeah. not not a not a beautiful yeah. day out today. No. All right, let's do it. Welcome everyone to episode number 77 of the Goulet Pencast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. We are back this week after missing last week, thanks to my illness, but I'm all better now. Yay. Uh, I got COVID for the first time. You missed it for three years, finally caught up with me, and uh, yeah, I was out. There you go. I was relatively with your back, stronger well, than ever. Relatively asymptomatic, so that, that was good. But anyway, hit Rachel much harder than it hit me, unfortunately. But that's usually how it goes with illness. It usually hits her, and then same I'm, thing happened in my house. And I'm just like, no, dear, you rest. I'm gonna do all the dishes. Yep. And clean up the house. I was tired. She was <laughs> deathly ill. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty much how it was with us. Um, but we're we're both much better. Anyway, in today's show, <coughs> excuse me. That was not an illness related thing. <laughs> I just ate an apple and I had a little bit of it left in my throat, but it's all good now. In today's show, we're gonna be talking about what you can look forward to in 2023 from Goulet Pens. Would we still enjoy the hobby if we were capped at $20 a pen? Uh, if replacing a feed would make a difference in writing like replacing a nib does, we'll discuss stingy pens versus gushers and which might surprise you about how we like them. Uh, and we also discuss our music tastes, not pen related at all. We'll spotlight the ST DuPont Line D. We're gonna play Two Truths and a Lie and lots more fun banter to come. Should be fun. Hopefully yes. we'll make up for missing last week. Uh, and we're gonna start that off with some feedback. All right. All right, Drew, what you got here? Laura mm -hmm. says, I have a Caveco Palm Green Oh, Caveco Palm Green, the color in my green Lilliput. Mm. I think it's the perfect match, but maybe I should check out Drew's fave, Spearmint. hey -o. Uh I haven't used Palm Green. Neither have I. I don't carry the Quaco ink. Well, why would you need to when you have Spearmint, <laughs> Laura? Okay. You there definitely you should try it. And if you don't like it, Brian will give you your money back. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about all that, no. but uh, um, just uh, yeah, ink is defective. I yeah. would, you know, but. Uh, and then Janice <laughs> says the battle of the pens was everything. Please continue to add that to your pen casts. We basically all of the comments last week were either yeah. please more pen battle. <laughs> Or I also do that terrible cartridge thing that Brian does, which, which we'll get to yeah, later. I that was pretty much, that was like all of all the comments the were. It was That's like great. those two things. Um, but my friend <laughs> Becky says, I hear you with the full price Nintendo games because we were talking about how they never go on sale. Right. Although my partner gifted me Kirby Forgotten Land for Christmas and I'm having so much fun playing that game. Nice. Becky, uh, we got that for my son and I also have been playing that with him and it is so fun. We nice. beat the main story together, but... We're still working on that like extra hard stuff post game. So uh, mm, good gotten, luck with that. We haven't gotten that one. Might have to look into that. It's a ton of fun. Yeah? It's good co-op too. Okay. Yeah. I love that the kids are like the age where you can buy buy toys for them, but you're like, I really want to play this game. I So like, well, I got to get it for the kid, you know. He played the demo and really liked it. So he asked for it for Christmas. And I didn't even know it was co-op. 
Um, so oh. I was like, yeah, sure. But then we That's found cool. out it was, and mm. you know, it's, it's cool, kind of tag teaming with them on yeah, the you know, kind of local co-op. Nice, very cool. Um, I got some feedback too. Like you said, it's pretty much about the cartridges. Um, so first one is from Arabelle Holtzapfel 2046. Sorry, but your name. Hold, hold up, Phil. Hold up, Phil. Uh, piping up to say that I not only have done what Brian does in a pinch, meaning put a cartridge in a pen without first cleaning the pen. That's how I used to routinely fill a fountain pen that had run out of ink. Just put another cartridge in. I have had one or more fountain pens since at least the mid 80s. And it wasn't until about 2017 that I started watching Brian's Fountain Pen 101 series. And that I found out that cleaning a pen is not only possible, but a really good thing to do. Love you guys, thanks for all you do. Well, that's exactly why we put out those videos. Um, you'd be surprised to know how many people have that kind of feedback like, So oh, many. I didn't know that cleaning a pen was necessary no. or even possible. <laughs> and, well, not so many people are just like, yeah, totally, I'd do that. It's, it's absolutely fine. And in fact, Lamy, like just last week, put out a, a like a, you know, um, how to clean your pen and actually says there, you know, no need to clean. You can watch it, you know, change from red to blue. Like it's a fun thing to do. I, I almost feel like I'm in the minority here because so many people were like, yeah, I do that all the time. It doesn't hurt anything. So I think maybe if you're using cartridges specifically, it's within the same brand, mm -hmm. you're generally pretty safe to do that. It's when you go mixing brands and you use you know, boutique inks that are more saturated and have more unique properties that you could potentially run into issues. So for me, it was like drilled into me very early on. Like you clean your pen between every ink that you use. That's what I've always done. But I think ultimately it's not like your pen's going to blow up. Yeah. You know, worst case is going to kind of crust up or gel up or something like that. If you got, mo unless it's a particularly valuable pen, you can probably take it mostly apart, clean it out if you need to. So I don't think it's something you need to be like totally living in fear of. Just be aware that if you are just throwing inks in there willy-nilly without cleaning them, you could end up with some interesting things happening. But I don't know. Go for it. Do whatever floats your boat. Um, Miss Wolferstar. Well, Miss... Wow, I can't read these names at Flower all today. Flower Star. Miss Flower Star. The, fla the O is like a zero. Okay, anyway. Um, says, that's the reason I use cartridges. In some pens, I like to fill the cartridges, but I use my other cartridge pens exactly as Brian describes. I like how Lamy Violet slowly turns into Lamy Turquoise. I mean, that's cool. Go for it. I mean, that's the same concept as like the Pilot Parallel. That's how they work. Yeah. You have two different, I mean, the way that they advertise the parallel is you basically have one pen inked with one, one pen inked with the other. You can touch the nibs together or the plates as they yeah. are on that pen. And it kind of like blends the ink a little bit and then you get sort of an ombre effect. Yep. Now they, they those are like mixable ink cartridges. So they're kind of like marketed, geared more yeah. towards that. But especially if you have any like lesser saturated ink colors, they'll blend together like that. And you can do that. You can literally do that with any pen. It's just easier with the plates on yeah. the parallel. So anyway, well, I didn't know I was hitting on such a, a chord it's with a everybody. It's a very popular technique. Te I guess it's a technique. Lack of technique. Yeah. All right. Um, and then Modern Synthesis says, Brian's most mentioned pen things. Number one, Lamy 2000. Number two, that time he washed a blue fire lily put. Yep. Uh, number three, that time he did something with a carport <laughs> with a traveler's pen in his pocket. Yep. Those do get mentioned a they lot. They do get mentioned a lot, don't they? Maybe I need to change up my repertoire a little bit. Getting a bit, you just need to do some, getting a bit predictable. You need to, need to do something even wilder and more crazy with a fountain pen in your pocket. Apparently. Chop a tree down with a fountain pen, with a pen? next time. What, yeah. What pen would be the ideal pen to try to take a tree down with? Some like a, a, a eyedroppered collier. It'd have to be like a very durable pen. Like no, a collier something, wouldn't something, make it. it wouldn't no, make I, it. that's what I'm recommending. No, it has something to be like a... Some massive uh, eyedropper pen. Let's do an emperor. Oof. I couldn't do that, man. <laughs> I couldn't do that. It was funny. Uh, I, I don't remember who commented on it either, but... Uh, someone had said Drew and Brian both had cringy moments where Drew was cringing at Brian's pen cleaning habits and Brian <laughs> was cringing at Drew returning a power tool after he's used it once. Oh, yeah. that was Because <laughs> we both had our moments. That was not a proud moment. I will say, I will say mine was a little more shameful than yours. Yeah. In fact, I did the opposite. Recently, I, I recently bought a tool. It was not the right thing that I thought it was, and I ended up keeping it anyway because I was like, <laughs> actually, I could, probably, I could probably use this. It wasn't the right thing, but... You well, see, you've, you've said before that sometimes you'll get a tool without having a purpose for it, oh, yeah. and then you'll the purpose will come simply by having the tool. Oh, yeah. I get inspired by the tool. Yeah, for sure. 
I do the same thing with pens. I'm like buying a pen. I'm like, I don't need any more pens. That's like true. I literally don't need any more pens. No. But yeah, I've gotten, I've acquired two more today. In fact, Go two figure. more tools, two more pens. Oh, no, pens. Yeah, okay. Pens. I was about yeah. to say, you've been here all day. What? Are you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I did okay. buy some tools online last night, actually. Oh, goodness. They were on sale. They were really good sale. Home Depot has a lot of really good sales. I wonder if like- battery, could... They had batteries at like 70% off. And I was like, I could use more batteries because I've been using these good. tools all the time. I wonder if I could buy you a tool that would like, unknowingly send you down a hobby path that you did not want to go down, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to help yourself because you would have the tool and you'd be like, well, I have to use this. It's possible. It's possible. I'll, I'll, I'll I can't keep, think of what that might be. I'll but keep a lookout. It's, it's happened before. It's okay. happened before. Anyway. All right. Let's talk about some new stuff, shall we? Let's. All right. We are still in a bit of a dry spell. It's been a very, very, very slow start to 2023 it new product wise unusual for us but that's quite all right we do have some stuff that's finally trickled in uh the biggest one being the lamy all-star petrol and it's that Lilac time of year special editions i think this is the first time they've ever done a pair of all-stars they've done multiple safaris at once yeah but i think it's the first pair of all-stars and they're both pretty solid so they are. got a video put on on those um, which you can go check them out in more detail. I spend way too much time talking about which pens they compare to and which inks can match them. Well, I mean, after so many years of so many All-Star videos, there's really not a whole lot else to say. Yeah, what am I going to say? Like, it comes in this nib and it's got a translucent grip. You know what an All-Star is. You know what a Safari is. you pretty much know. So I'm like, okay, what color is it? And what matches it? So that's pretty much what the videos are these days. Anyway, so I've got that out there. I'm very excited about the new Clairefontaine Triumph notebooks. These were so exciting. Oh my gosh, I don't get all that excited about new paper products because a lot of them are kind of like, all right. At this point, like how- Pretty like, much no. Yeah, is it going, going to give on. us a different experience? Usually yeah. no. Yeah, but, but I have been a fan of Clairefontaine Triumph from day one. The beginning. Like, literally was like the first paper I used that completely blew my mind. Before it, fountain pens. Yeah, it has never, has never let me down. Yeah. And uh, yeah, to see it in a new format, I'm like, same paper just bound instead of stationary. I'm like, I'm on board with this. So uh, yeah, very excited about that. Go check those out. A5 size with what, two two colors. There's a cream and a white and mm -hmm. there's a line and a blank. Yep. Very simple, very straightforward, but they're nice. The nice like stitch binding. So they're not the staple bound, very high quality. Paper's amazing. Dry time might be a little long for some people. That's the only drawback. Not like Tomoe River long, but. No, it's, if you can deal with Tomoe River, you can deal with Triumph. Yeah. It's, it's no problem. Um, anyway, so great paper though. Oh, it feels so good to write on that paper. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Pilot of Roshizuku uh, ink sets. So these are new, not new inks. Same inks, repackaged, I guess. Would yeah. Be the way to describe it. New, new, um, new bottles. Not like the mini, mini bottles, but no, they're like totally new. They're smaller, like squatty, squattier, trapezoidal type they're shape be bottles. Between the normal bottles and those little tiny mini bottles that we've seen. Yeah, in the years mini bottles prior. are what, like eighteen mil or something really small. These are tiny. these are thirty mil, so they're yeah. kind of in between. Um, so if you want to get a mixture of inks, it's nice. They come in these, um, you know, new packaging. So they come in this like nice presentation it's box. It's like a gift box, yeah. Yeah, and you get three different colors. So there's six different sets of three different colors. So it's all the Uroshizuku colors, all kind of like mixed up with each other. Um, they're gonna be kind of a limited supply. Yeah, I so, hear they're very limited. Yeah, so, um, you know, if you are like really interested in it, I would like move this more towards the top of your list. Um, but you can check out the which bottles come in which set and then um, pick them up for $60 and 80 cents. Yeah, and they, all, they are on our website right now. So you can sign up to be notified when they do get in stock. Like you yeah, said, these I mean, are limited. So I would get on that list. Yeah, as so we're recording we this, you. we have on our like launch calendar, like Friday question mark. Yeah. So I don't know if they'll be launched by the time that these come out. But um, yeah, if you do sign up for the email thing, then you'll know as soon as we get them in. That's all I got, Drew. What about you? I've got some stuff. Yeah. Uh, we launched the Estherbrook SD in Petrified Forest yeah. recently. That is a uh, $175, $50, not $175.50 pen. Um, like all of the other SDs, it's a beautiful pen. It feels very, very well balanced and high quality in the hand. Mm -hmm. has that beautiful cushion, cushion cap, cap that yeah. I love so much. Mm -hmm. The nibs keep looking better. It's got their new um, kind of the E that looks kind of like a clovery. I like it's that. It's like hearts or they've got a very or yeah, yeah they've cool. got a very simplistic nib design, which I think is yeah. very attractive. They changed over that logo what like a year, year yeah. and a half ago, something like that. Yeah, it's been a while, but their nice. nib, I think, I think that 
symbol lends itself really well to their nib design. It does, so it's it a very pretty pen. Check it out. It's available now. Yeah. Um, also available now, um, by the time this pencast publishes, is a new Line D ST DuPont pen. Ooh. And this is their Carbon series, which we've been looking forward to for quite a while. Yeah, It's very different than other Line D pens. Normally, um, their kind of standard line of line D pens are more professional, subdued, uh, a little bit yeah, more subtle like, than this. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course they've got kind of the crazy special editions like the Space Odyssey, but this mm -hmm. one is kind of a crazy, more regular-ish edition. Anyway, it's made of a carbon fiber, um, I guess it would be a um, composite of some kind, like a carbon fiber yeah, composite. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's similar to, in look anyway, to the forged carbon paniter pen. It looks like it's not carbon fiber that's been woven, it's carbon fiber that's been compressed in some way mm -hmm. and then turned into the shape of a pen. However, it's not just black. Each of these three colors have um, the black carbon fiber that we are familiar with, as well as a white, a blue, or a red color woven throughout the carbon it's fiber. It's really kind of crazy looking. I've never seen a carbon fiber that looks like this. No, not quite this bright really, for sure. Yeah, it's, and it's then wild. the cap is really unique too. It's kind of like a, I won't call it spiky, but almost like a studded. Knurled. Knurled. Yeah, knurled is a good word. Yeah. Knurled is exactly what it is, in mm -hmm. fact. Yeah. Um, I, it, I, I didn't go there because every time I think knurled, I think like chrome. But this is the same exact shape, but uh, matte black. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. It looks like a, you know, um, kind of like a matte black Retro 51 knob or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's right up that. there. So it's but very big, grippy. chunky yeah. knurling. Yeah. So anyway, that uh, comes in Dark wild. Storm, Fiery Lava, or Glacial Cave. And those are $1,300, $1,356. So Not they're the cheapest things in the world. But they're up there with DuPont look, prices. They look really cool. And I said they look even cooler in person than yeah. in photograph. If you get a chance to see it in person ever, it's pretty wild. They look really good. Yeah. And then finally, the most important thing to talk about today, Brian. Oh, yeah? Ferris wheel press. Has it finally, uh, has it finally happened? It's popping. <laughs> Buttered popcorn. This is an ink that Brian has just been trying to get us to carry for so long. He just <laughs> won't shut up about it. Yeah, you know me. No, I have been not annoying Brian and Rachel to no end about this ink because when we first, you're not supposed to You've been to annoying me. Like, I, no, I've always been on board with the okay. popcorn. I was not. I was not the the road the the roadblock to carrying this ink. I just. But ye on. yellow inks in general are really not very popular. No, for but us. this one is a good yellow. It's a good yellow. It's there it's go. it's vibrant enough to be seen, but not so vibrant that it's definitively orange either. Yeah. And yeah. I remember I, if anybody has been listening to this for a while, you may remember when I was in search of the best yellow, and. In the in behind the scenes, what I didn't tell y'all about was that I discovered buttered popcorn. <laughs> but I couldn't really talk about it because then you'd be like, well, why aren't you selling it, Drew? And I'd have to say, I don't know, it's sad. Uh, but it was there. And yes, um, I found some other good ones, but buttered popcorn is the champ, man. It is the champ yellow. It's a good color. And we are carrying it. It's beautiful. It's gotta be, if, if, if the yellow is the right shade of yellow, like I'm a big fan of Dye Mine Golden Sands. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of Urban Amber de Bermani, mm -hmm. or Amber de Bermani. Amber de Bermani. Amber de Bermani. But that's a good one too. So it's like, it can be good, but then like Dye Mine, like Sunshine Yellow, I'm like, this is too useless. Much. Too like, much. It's like a highlighter. It's basically, you can't see it. Mm -hmm. So it's gotta be the right yellow. Butter popcorn is the right yellow. I don't know. It's that good, good. I'm I, telling you. I told Drew we need to like make a video where he's got actual popcorn and he's like drizzling buttered popcorn <laughs> ink on it like movie popcorn because mm. that's basically what it looks like mm. anyway so, yeah. it's here it has arrived it's a totally mm. regular ink but i normally we do like <laughs> i do writing samples for like a limited special edition yeah but i don't know rachel but added it to my list to do these so i'm like okay i think she just knows how much joy it's going to bring you it's just so funny how like fired up drew is about this particular i don't ink. know what it I just, it's I'm not, pretty know. jazzed up about buttered popcorn. Would you be this excited about it if you hadn't like inked up all yellow inks a little while back? Like, did you did you already have an affinity towards buttered popcorn or do you think No, that, like, I think it was because of the, is that, did that, of my like, yellow ink. It off? Well, you just need to take the time to focus on appreciating a particular type of, type of color. And I think that mm. if you focus on appreciating that type of color, eventually you will end up appreciating it. If I you seek that out, you will find it. I think that's fair. It's a good idea. Yeah. So yeah, I, I absolutely advocate for anybody to 
pick a color that they don't often use, be it magenta or brown mm. or something that they just don't normally find. Gray is a good one. Mm. If there's a color that you just don't gravitate towards, pick up like five samples of that color and just this is what I'm going to focus on. Ink up all your pens with those, yeah. write with the, nothing but that color, and I guarantee you, you will find more. You will hate it less, I'm sure, at yeah. least. Olive green, that's another one that oh, yeah. you might not think to try, but then Absolutely. you try a few and you're like, actually, this looks I did that good. with uh, Verit Olive. Yeah, that's uh, a good one too. Beautiful. A lot of the Urban colors are like sleepers. Like a yeah. lot of them are really, really good. They're staples. But they're subtle. They're yep. subtle. Cool. All right. Well, there you go. So we got some new stuff to look forward to. Check out. We don't have a lot in our new arrivals section on our site right now, but we do have a bunch of stuff incoming soon. So we got some Sailor Bespoke stuff in there. We got some other cool things. So check that out soon. All right. Let's move it on to the Q&A. All right. <clears throat> We're kicking things off from Lel MC and Lel is asking any clues for what 2023 holds for Goulet pens, new products, businesses, etc. Mm. Uh, there will be new things. <gasps> there will this year. What yeah, new things? We're doing Brian? new things. Tell us all of them. Uh, yeah, because I've like got it all figured out. <gasps> um, I mean, I don't really have a lot of hyper specific things to share. Um, nothing crazy out of left field. We're not like. What about right up, field? Sitting up, right, nope, no real right field either. Ah. I'm staying in the infield, I guess. I don't know what this metaphor is. Baseball! That's right, sports game. Um, nothing nothing crazy. Uh, just a lot of what you know and love about what we do. We're going to keep doing more of that. Mm. Um, we have some exclusive in the works from various brands. We do. Nothing I'm going to tip my hat on just yet. Tip my hat, mm. tip do my we have? Do we have an exclusive planned for a brand we've never had an exclusive with? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I'm not, that's not a loaded question. I really don't have any idea. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I legitimately can't re recall. I don't, right I don't this think moment. so. I don't think we do. I don't think so, but it's not that it couldn't happen. I'm not yeah. sure. It definitely could happen. Um, yeah, it could always happen. You never know. Yeah, right now, um, like I, there are a solid handful of exclusives we have going on. Oh yeah, on. we've kind of always got stuff in the works. Yeah, and, like we work on a timeline that can be rather extended. I mean, we have some exclusives that, like, especially if it's not really on us, like we're waiting on the manufacturer to have capacity or some future reason to develop something. I mean, we have some exclusive ideas that we've been throwing out for like years mm -hmm. with certain brands and you just kind of wait forever. And then all of a sudden it happens like the Lamy Vista like last year, that was, we've been talking about a Lamy exclusive for, I don't know, eight years or something like that. And then finally it just kind of ended up happening. So you never know, um, but we have all kinds of ideas in the works with various brands. Um, so yeah, there will definitely be more of that. I'm not looking to get away from that. Um, I'll say like, this is a great question, but I don't like, just because it's the start of the year, I know there's like temptation to be like, oh yeah, what's happening this year? I honestly don't know yet. Cause we like, we finished out the holiday season, you know, Rachel and I were just ill. So we're kind of getting back on our feet there. And then we are like going to be meeting with a bunch of our reps and stuff like that mm -hmm. coming up. We have a lot of planning. We have our like, development reviews for our team and a that's lot of happening. that stuff. Like, that's happening, like that started happening right now. Yeah, like literally when Rachel and I tested positive with COVID, we were having like our leadership offsite planning meeting we were virtual already, thank goodness. But, you know, like that was already kind of like happening. So it was like, those are some of the things that we set out, like our initiatives and projects for the year. Um, so we have like a bunch of like work on our website planned and we have, you know, a bunch of things like that, but nothing that's like crazy going to blow your mind at this point. Um, but I'll say like we're the next couple of months, we're talking about like what we're going to do and what we're going to prioritize. So we'll definitely have stuff, um, but I just don't have like everything laid out for the year you know, by the end of January. It just doesn't usually shake out like that. We're usually like recovering from the holidays, trying to get things going at the start of the year. We get through our development interviews and then, um, you know, usually like March, April, we start to get more into like the projects for the year. But, I know right now yeah. we're also working on at least a couple um, order additives, you know, some freebies that we might be tossing in, you know, yeah, maybe a sticker, yeah. we'll mm -hmm. see. Yeah, you know, we we've got, got some of those types of things. Yeah, yeah, we've got some of those in the works yeah. as well. We talked about like pen shows, like traveling mm -hmm. more, like you went to a few, I didn't go to any last year. It's possible I could go this year, mm -hmm. you know, to some, we haven't decided like hardcore which ones yet, but that's something we're talking about. So we got a lot of ideas in the works. So is yeah. there anything that you think we should be focusing on this year? It is the beginning of the year, so we can think yeah. about things. We can yeah. add some things to our to-do list of 2023, be it video wise, pen cast wise, or just website store wise. Yeah. If there are things that you would like us to kind of just kind of keep our eyeballs on, let us know. Yeah. And we will 
mm-hmm. read it. <laughs> there you go. We will look at it and <laughs> make no further commitment beyond that. But yeah, anyway, so that's that's kind of what we got kicking off right now. Sorry, I don't have like a lot of hyper specific things. Are we going to have an exclusive Mont Blanc? Uh, at this point, we do not have any plans. <laughs> But if anybody from Mont Blanc is watching, <laughs> hit me up and, uh, you know, we could talk. Anything. I, I anything like how optimistic possible. you are. <laughs> I like to leave the, the door open. I'm not opposed to it. There we go. Fantastic. But it's not, not likely to happen, probably. Not impossible. Not impossible. That's right. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, goodness. All, All right. right. Moving along. Next question I got is from Mark Summers, 7816. Um, do you think this is Mark Summers, like from uh, Nickelodeon back in the no, day? No, that's like, Summers. No? no, I've actually spoken to this Mark uh, plenty of times. Okay, well, I'm no. sure you're. He's cool still too, cool Mark. though. Yeah, he's not. He's not the host of Double Dare, but he seems yeah. like he seems like a pretty yeah. solid dude. Or what would you do? Yeah, any of that show too. Yeah, I, I, I was a, I was a child of Nickelodeon in the '90s. <laughs> Definitely knew what's up. Watch a lot of slime get dropped on people back in my day. Anyway, um, okay, so Mark asks, would you still enjoy the fountain pen hobby if your maximum pen value was limited to $20 or less? I'm curious, because I think you interpreted this question a little differently than I did. All right, you remember what I said about Mark, Mark Somers being cool? I don't think he's cool anymore. Because this, yeah, this, 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 this is a tough one. This is a low budget, no, man. I don't like him anymore. $20 All right, or less. Mark. Okay, if my maximum pen value Mm-hmm. was limited to $20 or less. Um, How did you interpret this? Because I, I interpreted it as like, I can not I can buy as many pens as I want, but they have to be under $20. Yeah, I mean, that that makes sense. Um, yeah, that, 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 that seems about right. Um, okay. But... Uh, I mean, that's... It doesn't really matter how often... Limits you, that limits idea, you. You're, you're going to buy the same yeah, pens over and over so, again. So uh, the answer is... Would would I still enjoy the hobby? Mm-hmm. No, I would not enjoy <laughs> the hobby. I would mm. still enjoy writing with fountain pens. Okay, but the hobby word would mm. not be a thing. Like really? R- yeah, because I um like I like wearing a watch. Okay, I do not. I am not a watch hobbyist. Okay, a watch is not my hobby. Right. I have one. Great. The end. Okay. I do not pursue anything above having it and using it. Okay. That's if I had a twenty dollar limit, that's how it would be with me and fountain pens. Yeah. Because I, I would use it like any other pen, but with a twenty dollar limit, I wouldn't want to pursue the hobby. Like that would just make me sad. I mm. wouldn't. I'd buy a bunch of Cognos and I'd be done. Mm. I can't buy a Twisby. I guess I could buy a Go. Um, wait, no, a Go. Is twenty, isn't it? Um, I don't know. I th- yeah, I think it might. There'd be just a few. I'd just end up writing with. I couldn't afford a Metropolitan. Couldn't afford an Explorer. It'd just be the Kakuno. Um, preppy. I wouldn't want a Preppy. I would just write with a Kakuno all the time. Oh, okay. Why would I choose a Preppy over Kakuno? Like, I mean, nah, because it's different. Yeah. I mean, it, if your budget was only twenty dollars, you'd buy every pen you true. could for twenty dollars. That's true. You're right. You're right. I would. You know? I would, but I would just end up writing with Kakunos all the time. So. Uh, the hobbyist aspect would be completely gone for me. It would just be a utilitarian thing, and that's fine. I, I There are plenty of people I know that love fountain pens that just use them as an everyday utility. So I could find enjoyment there. I could adapt to my new life. Uh, Varsity. But it would be... Shark pen. Yeah. No. Preppy. It would be a sad sad existence that I would, would not... Um, Profonte. Nah. Similar to Preppy. Parallel. Parallel's a good pen. Parallel's fun. Platinum desk pen. Yeah, parallel would keep me going. Like, you could. Stay, you can have a lot of fun with a parallel. You could. You could. Because you can like grind the plates on a parallel yeah, too, and do yeah. some fun things. That would be. That would really help. That would really yeah, help. You could but, customize. Yeah. But I still don't think it would be enough for me to stay in the hobby. I wouldn't be checking websites to see what's new because it wouldn't mm, matter. Yeah. It wouldn't matter because nobody's going to be coming out with a sub twenty dollar pen anytime soon. They are. Lo- There's a lot of pens in that price range that have a lot of different colors. But it's all the same pen. Yeah, like it's all like. So no, that would severely damage damage that. I would just uh, the go is eighteen ninety nine. So you could do a go, a go. Yeah, I could do you a could go. do your beloved swipe though. I know it would be just. I would have a go, and I'd have a kakuno, and that you would are, just. You're fairly limited. It's like a handful of handful of yeah. models. So that yeah. that would be really tough. And yeah, so my answer is no. I would not enjoy the hobby. I would remove myself <laughs> from the hobby just so that I wouldn't get sad and depressed and be lonely. Um, <laughs> because I would not like seeing all that stuff that I can't get. You, like, you can't even... That's true. Yeah. 
can't even save up multiple twenty dollars. It's like twenty dollars is the max there. Yeah, it's like when so, I take like Joseph is really into like Lego and Star Wars, like Lego Star Wars stuff. Then he like looks at Bricklink and he's like all into the telling me about the minifigures that cost these obscene amounts of money and stuff like that. And like take him to that brick, you know, mm -hmm. the, the bricks and minifigs store. We went there yesterday, in fact, and uh, it's kind of like that. He walks in there and just sees all this stuff that he can't afford, yeah. you know, and he's got like some birthday money and stuff like that. So he like, he has more money now than he usually does, but normally he's like, okay, I'll just sort through the bin and get my little tub mixed up, you know, stuff. But it's just like all these beautiful sets and crazy Star Wars minifigs and stuff like that, that he's just like, okay, yeah, I can't get that. No, I'd rather no. have a hobby that I can <laughs> engage in. Even, I don't need to spend a ton of money, but I need to at least have the option to, to know that like if I wanted mm. to, I could save up for that one nice thing, be it, you know, a watch, a knife, a video game or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I would probably recuse myself from the hobby zone mm. and, and withdraw to the casual utilitarian user zone and just mm. wave to all of you from afar <laughs> in my bubble of sadness. Fair enough. See, I I think I would still enjoy it, but it would be obviously seriously hampered. Yeah. There's a lot of cool stuff that gets over $20. Um, but I mean, I kind of had some experience with this because when I first when we first started Goulet pens, I didn't, I really didn't have any pens that were worth, I mean, if there were any that were worth over $20, it was like just barely, like a Lamy Joy or something. Mm. that would have been just over $20. Um, that was pretty much all the pens that I had were really inexpensive pens. You know, I had the, I had Preppies and Pelican Scripts, which I think was around $20 or something and Parallels, like those types of pens. And what I did is I just used really cheap pens. I had a bunch of them in different nib sizes and I just got really into the ink and paper. So I think for me, I would shift away from the pens, which at that time I just, I really didn't even pay attention really this first year. So like 2009, 2010, I really didn't pay attention to many of the pen brands at all because they all just seemed so out of my reach. So I got really into the cheap pens that were kind of like known and you know, established mm -hmm. and that I could afford. And then I just used ink and paper and that kept a very rich writing experience for me. Yeah, I know so, a lot of people that are, that seem to be just as much into the ink as they are the pens. Absolutely. I'm like, not, I'm way more into the pens. Well, that's okay. I mean, yeah. I wonder how much of that is just because of like the accessibility. Like, you know, if you didn't, if you weren't surrounded by all these like really nice pens all the time and like, cause you have to like, you're like writing sample and testing them and like all yeah. that kind of stuff. So they're like in your hands all the time. Yeah. But if you didn't pay as much attention to like which new pens are coming out and paid a lot more attention to just like the ink and paper and stuff, I still feel like there's a lot Maybe. to enjoy there. Maybe. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's kind of how I feel about that it. That makes sense. That there's makes lot, sense. There's a lot of people I know that don't have big budgets that enjoy the crud out of fountain pens. Right, but not they, having a big budget versus never, ever being like able being to spend capped, more than $20. Like on it? that, like. Mm. Not even thirty-five. Like, see, in the way that Mark phrased it here is like your maximum pen value is limited to twenty or yes. less. Yes, that's not even saying like you can only buy twenty-dollar pens because I'd be like, oh, I'd buy like thirty of those, and right. then I would trade it with somebody for like a <laughs> you know really nice that's pen. Really diabolical, no, Mark. Maximum value is limited to twenty dollars. <laughs> like, dang it! Like, you really, uh, you really locked us jerk. in there. But no, I mean, I I did that for the first year, like. Yeah, easily for the first year of fountain pens, I had something that wasn't worth much more than twenty dollars at all. Yeah, and I could be into that. And for I really a year, but then it. I'd be like, okay, I can't proceed from here. I'd feel like I'm. Well, you'd have to you'd have to be much more into like the using of the pens. Yeah, like it would it would not be so much like appreciating the quality and the theming and like all that stuff like of the pen itself. It would be much more like as a tool what you could do with it, kind of a thing. Um, so I know a lot of people who are like artists and urban sketchers and all that kind of stuff, and they really don't have expensive pens. They're just into them as tools, and then they just use them in much more creative ways than mm -hmm. I do. So yeah, I might need. But that's not just <laughs> Be more creative. Okay, so I, I'm going to cap you off, Drew. I'm going to take all your pens that are worth more than twenty dollars, and uh, we're going to see how it goes for the next year. What do you say? That would not set me up. <laughs> For success, no, Brian, really, as my leader in this really, company, you would be really wouldn't. hindering my progress. I'd be like, Drew's only going to test pens now that are less than twenty dollars. My evaluation <laughs> the next year would be terrible. Be like, Drew, you really were useless this year. What gives? <laughs> you took all my stuff. Drew played with a lot of ink this year. He's really into <laughs> ink now. Um, yeah, but anyway, cool. Well, all good, right. good question. Nice. Yeah, that was... like, I think people liked watching us be so uncomfortable when we did the pen battle thing, and oh. now they're just like, let's let's just ask them questions to make them square. Yeah, that burned. <laughs> all right. This uh, number three comes to us from Dan. 
And Dan says, we hear so often about an upgrade to a pen, replace the nib. How about the feed? Does that have the same impact or is a feed a feed? Can I buy, mm. oh no, I can buy a Goulet replacement nib, but mm -hmm. no feeds. Just curious as to how the feed can influence the writing experience. Oh, this is such a good question. And such a difficult question to yeah. answer. I really struggled with this one, to be honest with you. This is a super smart question, yeah. It really is. Because they the two really do pair together. Like yeah. they, they do matter a lot. But people ask way um, more questions about the nib. No one asks about the feeds. Yeah, and it's interesting. Like And that's good because I couldn't answer them. Yeah, and that's like we don't have as much information to share about the feeds. Like I know they're really important. There's a ton of like engineering and like very specific like fine detail that goes into feed design. Yeah, I do know that. But I couldn't tell you much about it because nothing about it is shared or talked mm. about from any manufacturer, basically, no, we'd at need all. To, we'd need to get somebody else on the show for that. Yeah. Um, so I have some limited knowledge here, but that didn't keep me from listing out a whole bunch of bulleted thoughts. So I'll talk through what I can. Um, there's not a lot of great info out there about feed or even options to swap them or test them or anything. Um, so... It's really difficult to gain a lot of confidence in what you're doing with swapping feeds uh, without just like kind of just trial and error and just randomly trying stuff. Um, so uh, feeds more or less, more or less just need to work. There's not really a lot of like swapping and customization so much that's done with them. Um, essentially a feed's job is to provide consistent ink flow and it kind of does two things you know the feed it regulates the amount of air that comes in to replace the ink that um to i guess to displace the ink that's that's coming out so if you have too much air coming in then you're going to have too much ink going out it's going to write really wet and blobby and kind of burp everywhere if you don't have enough it's going to write really stingy and not flow well so pretty much for any given pen you just need a feed that provides that consistent level you know, of ink flow to match up to the nibs. Now, this is where like, I'm not 100% sure how every manufacturer does it. The most insight I've ever been given was in talking to Twisby because they've developed their own feeds. They make their own feeds for their nibs. And what uh, Philip at Twisby has, has told me before on the phone is that they use a slightly different feed for the broads and stubs mm -hmm. than they do for their extra fine through medium because they want a feed that delivers ever so slightly more ink flow for the broader, wetter nibs. And I think that's really cool and super thoughtful. I don't know if every brand does that. I don't think so. I don't think that that's something most other pen brands do. If they did, they're not talking about it. And maybe there is certain feed designs that can accommodate a broader spectrum a flow, I don't know. Like you look at like Lamy's feed, theirs has like layers to it. You can take it apart in two pieces. Very strange. Theirs is crazy looking and I don't even understand what's happening with that. But I mean, every feed essentially has, you know, a channel that the ink flows down through. There's fins of some kind happening in there to act as like regulators for the ink. And then there's some kind of air hole that allows air to flow in or to fill the pen through. Every feed has those basic components to it but the exact design and specifications of the feed is is pretty different from from uh, some pens to others, and I honestly couldn't tell you like if you changed some of those aspects of it, what it would do. I don't really know. It's kind of mystery. Mysterious. It is, and then they all look so very different. Platinum's is pretty complicated looking as well. Yeah, and Pilot they have theirs where like the air hole that that fills it like on the custom 74 and the 823 mm -hmm. it's not set up along the backside it like runs through the middle of the feed right and then crazy. there's another there's a it, there's a rod inside of that hole yeah as well it's, yeah and that it's very unique so very strange. it is really interesting i imagine it's the kind of thing that like there's very fine tolerances and just a ton of engineering that goes into creating those feeds so the reason they don't talk about it much is because it's super proprietary and that's like some of the magic like special sauce of how they do it i mean really in nibs they don't really talk about how they make the nibs either there's no detailed specifications about them it's just you know the nib is you know different from one pen to another like you can get different nib sizes but if there are different feeds that are on different pens, it's never advertised or they don't talk about it. It's like just hidden and out of the way. And then you look at some feeds, you've got a single channel and you get some feeds that have two really, really tiny channels, like the main ink channel. 
Like, mm-hmm. how do they decide which one they're going to do and I why? Don't know, like trial and error? Yeah. Are they unless tested a lot or something? I genuinely don't know. Yeah. So it's, it's a bit, bit of a it's a bit of a black box. Yeah. So it kind of just it kind of just works, and we don't really think about it beyond that. Yeah. But I was I was and I racked my brain. I was trying to think of like what analogy works for this because that's like when you're trying to explain something and 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 you know especially to somebody that's not as familiar with it, like analogies work really well. I came up with two analogies. None of them I really love. But I'll try. Oh boy! Um, so I always try to think of like, okay, what about like cars or or food or sports or something like that that right. like we all kind of generally get the idea. Yes. So I was thinking like a car. Like okay, so like you have your nib, which like can change your writing experience. You know, so like maybe your nib is sort of like your tires on your car. Like you can have different tires to like snow tires, off road, mm-hmm. track tires. Okay, you can change out those tires. So like, what is the feed? Like maybe that's like the drivetrain or like the axle to your car. Like you don't think about what your axle is doing in your car. Mm-hmm. You just know that it just kind of has to work. You're not changing out the axle on your car, but it's a super crucial, important part. It ha- like nothing happens with that car if you don't have a properly working you got axle nothing to stick your wheels on. or drivetrain. But like the axle on a, you know, whatever, your sports car is going to be very different than like a heavy hauling truck. So you have to have the right type of axle for your vehicle, you know, but you don't think about it very often. It just has to work. That's kind of like what a feed is, I guess. Maybe that's the best metaphor that I could come up with. I'm not in love with it. The other thing I thought of, and I don't like this analogy nearly as much, (laughs) but I'm just going to share it because I went through the mental exercise. Um, So I was thinking about like, if you have a, if you're, this is like more of a kitchen metaphor or analogy, whatever. Um, so if you're buying a blender, right? You're familiar with blenders. I'm clearly boring, Drew, no. just as we're talking. You're like, I'm like openly yawning in front I'm, of me. I'm, I'm yawning a lot. And like a couple times I've like held it back. So I'm like, sure, <laughs> someone's going to see me doing this. Like, like, is Drew in pain? No. I'm just very yawny just right very, now. very bored by this conversation. No, that's not what it no, is. Okay, I, I, I can love take it. A Tell me your bad analogy. Yeah. Um, so if you're buying a blender, <laughs> right, there's a lot of features of the blender, like the size of it and like what it's meant for, the chop functions and features and all that kind of stuff, right? So like that's pretty obvious things. But like you don't think about the blades like on your blender. Like you know that the blades are engineered very specifically mm-hmm. and they like they chop, they do, they do things. But you're not like buying blades from one brand of a blender and putting it onto another. You right. just kind of expect that like somebody's designed and engineered that yeah. and it's just kind of supposed to work as it's designed. So it's maybe kind of like that. But then mm-hmm. I was like, maybe the blades are more like the nibs. I don't know. But then what's the what's the feed in this situation? The yeah. motor? I don't know. And even if we, <laughs> here's my thing. Even, even if we did want to be able to replace the nib just as much as we replace, mm-hmm. no, sorry, replace the feed just as much as we replace the nibs. We can't because they don't make. They don't really fit they, yeah, no, each you, other. They don't make a, it, it's There's so. There's no universal feed. It's so specifically engineered for that particular grip section that there can't be, there can be some somewhat universal nibs if we're talking number six, number five. Yeah. There's a little bit of that. There's nothing like that for um, feeds. The only thing that, yeah. I've seen people be successful with on the internet is to go to the um, website Flexible Nib Factory. They are the only place I know of that mm-hmm. if you wanted to get a replacement ebonite feed for something that fits, you know, other more popular pens, you know, this one place, this one guy, you know, makes them in small, small, small batches. Yeah. Um, but it's not something that. But it's is, not universal. Like it's made. Like if you want to get a ebonite feed for a. Pilot, whatever custom yeah, it's eight twenty three. It's basically like you got to buy the Pilot custom eight twenty three feed, feed that he's designed. Then that that'll fit like a you know Yovo number six or something like that. It's like yeah, but it's you're basically saying I want to have this nib available on this pen, so you buy a feed specifically for that. It's not like yeah, it, it's and you're not buying it to be like I want a feed that's a wetter or a drier. Well, he actually does have. Can, can he modify it? Like well, that? no, you you can buy two channel versus three channel depending okay. on what. So sort of so, sort of that. But idea. yeah, yeah, you're talking about one place that does it. It's definitely not something that's on the radar of most pen companies or no, any pen companies. He's not even a pen company. So yeah. um it's a it's just not on their radar so it can't really be on ours because that option just isn't even available yeah. to us. Like I've known the only thing that I've known that like in terms of like a, even a modification I guess mm-hmm. of feeds is and this is very very sketchy to oh, do yeah. but people who like take an exacto knife and like carve out yeah. like the channel on you their can do feed that. i know more people that have ruined it than have done it successfully yeah. but it is a technique that i've heard especially if anybody's like 
adding flex or something like that, they need like increased ink flow, like pretty yeah. dramatically increased ink flow. That is a technique. And if it's an ebonite feed, you can potentially use an automatic tool of some kind, like a Dremel, because ebonite is yeah, a different yeah. material than plastic. It doesn't like melt initially, but something right. like a Dremel will completely melt a yeah, plastic feed. No, so with you that, you would need to use some type like of blade. Yeah, yeah, but that's that's pretty sketchy. So yeah, unfortunately, I don't have like the best information to share on this topic, which should tell you something. I've been doing this 13 years, and I've shared everything I know with you about it, which is not much. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. Just use whatever the feed is that's in there and that's all you need. There are to worry enough about. inks out there that you can usually try enough until yeah. your feed is happy with whatever yeah. you're feeding it. And make sure it's clean. Like if you've never cleaned your pen, maybe try that. Absolutely. You might not need a new feed. All right. Moving on. Next question I've got is by six by six Matt says we know who loves the gushers and the extra fines but what are your exceptions i think i'm assuming we, i'm the gushers and yeah, you're the extra fines i would think here. so yeah but you like gushers too you're not like anti-gushing i'm not anti-gush no um I'm not anti -extra now fine. my mom would never buy gushers for me as a kid i'd always like oh, well, you know need just to straight up sugar that's why. i know yeah, that's a I good know. mothering right every there. now and then i'd be able to barter for you know a pack of gushers at the okay. lunch table you All know right. if i had something if like hey you want a snack pack yeah. give me those gushers but, uh, I was the same way. My mom never bought me gushers, yeah. but I always wanted them. Well, as a parent now, I'm like, these packets are so tiny. There's like four in here. Oh, yeah. I'm like, there's a better one. And it's like 50% of their daily sugar. Yeah. You're like, yeah, this is garbage. And then and the whole, like, is this a fruit snack or is this just a gummy candy? Like, oh, why candy? are they allowed to yeah. call it a fruit snack? It's not fruit. There's it's, no fruit in there. It's like, it's the same thing as a pack of gummy bears, but yet somehow they're marketed and put in a different position in the grocery store. Anyway. Yeah, yeah it's marketing. That's all it is. Um, Matt, I'm not anti-gush. I definitely, for, for writing, just everyday writing, taking notes, whatever, extra fine. I love extra fine. It's versatile. It no matter what paper I'm using, extra fine always seems to play well with it. So yes, that is my go-to for sure. Mm -hmm. um, however, when I'm playing, I like crazy nibs. Um, mm. As far mm -hmm. as writing, extra fine. Playing, wild nibs. Mm. So if I have a really fun ink, now when I say playing, I mean like like doodling or like just playing with ink if i've got a fun ink um any yeah. of the dual shaders like that's a fun ink i'm not i'm not taking notes with those but that is an ink i want to play with right and play Buttered popcorn <clears throat> mm -hmm. butter popcorn what, what would you be what would be your preferred nib for butter i popcorn? will say i haven't put that in an extra fine yet okay well, that tells it, me something right there I've doesn't had it, it i've had it in a fine and a medium not quite an extra fine but i will I will, uh, I believe but you. you know what? I will put it in. I'll put it in my E95S so I can get a little bit of bounce. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, if I've got a fun ink, like a dual shader, like, you know, Manyo Haha or something, I will put it in a bigger nib because I want to see all that fun. I yeah. want to see all that shade and it will work in extra fines just fine. And and so will, you know, shimmer inks and sheening inks. All that yeah, will work just fine in an extra fine. It's going to be subdued though. You're not going to see it's like Right. Potential. I really want it to pop. If you yeah. want a dual shader, a sheening ink, or a shimmering ink to really pop, then yeah, the bigger the better. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say when it gets to be in big nib territory, I will not go for a broad as soon as I will go for a larger stub. Mm. Um, I, I definitely prefer the stubs. I like the, it's just a fun, different experience. It's not like the broad is just an extension of kind of that standard nib. But when you step out of that, you're going into a whole different zone with mm. the 1.5 or mm -hmm. something like that. Ah, oh, that's so much fun. So I love, if I'm going to really step out, I'll like to go with an extra fine because, sorry, I like to go with a 1.5 because at that point, the ink gets spread in such a different way that you even get a different result than you would with a broad. That's I, true. Um, and that, if you've got an ink that, you're, that you really love, that you're familiar with, mm -hmm and uh, you've got a different experience with an extra fine, different experience with a broad, and then a different experience with a stub, just because of that that flat spread. It's less of a pooling yeah. like you would get with it's a broad. It's very different with or flex. Like flex yeah. and stub are not the same at all. Oh God, no. Very different writing experience. Yeah. Like and, and stub just kind of like, it, it paints it down really evenly, really cleanly, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't take nearly as, you can write with a, a good amount of ink, but it doesn't take nearly as much time to dry as it does with a broad because you're not. That's true. You're, yeah, you're putting down a lot of ink, but you're also spreading it 
in such a way it's that it's not it dries like all concentrated in one spot. Yeah, but yeah. you do get great shading with the stuff. Great shading. So if you like shading, mm -hmm. like I love the way things shade with the stub 1.1 or a five or a higher if you mm -hmm. want. What about shimmer? Shimmer, does shimmer show up more in a stub or like a wet bra? No, you want a pool for, in you my experience. Pool, like sheen, yeah. sheen is kind of the same way, right? In my experience, yeah. Okay, so you think shading shows up better in a stub. Yeah. Less so in maybe a flex or like a wet bra. That's my thought. Yeah. Depends on the ink. It does a little depend a little bit on the ink. It does, but properties. but like a, a stub puts down a very flat, like, yeah. you know, it's like a squeegee, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're squeegeeing, you got no water. And then wherever you lift it up, like that's yeah. where the water collects. That's right. kind of what a stub is. Right. And or then, like where you're crossing over. Yeah, of course. So like where you, you can have like that nice, even kind of like almost like a paintbrush, right? Mm -hmm. Especially with the 1.5 or broader, because mm -hmm. you get into like the Lamy 1.9, get into like parallels and the like Sailor High East Neo goes up to like a 2.0. Those get like, you can't write in like a normal lined ruling with those. You're like, you got to double skip your lines or you got to like you, go. You, yeah, it's, it's tougher. What, what I do if, I, if I'm if i um, stressed for space, I will stop because normally I write up and down like that when I'm doing a stub. I go under so that my downstrokes are nice and wide. Okay. But if I'm, if I'm limited on space, I'll start writing from the side so that it's kind of like faking an architect so okay. that your downstrokes are thinner oh, and your cross strokes are a little bit thicker. If, huh. if you just start writing, yeah. From, yeah, you're just turning the angle. Yeah, yeah. I, I do that hmm. if I'm a little stressed for space. Well, that's and, very, that's totally different in terms of like how you form your letters, right? No, like, I write, I write the same. I just, you you need, oh, so you're just like. You just need to give a little bit more space for certain things okay. like, um, uh, you need to give more, horizontal space yeah i guess because you are your words are going to be longer right right okay yeah. interesting unless never, you want to... uh, i never thought to do that i never thought to like turn a fat stub almost like 90 degree mm -hmm. angle to give it more of an architect that's actually how i feel. started writing with a stub really because my first pen was a lamy all-star 1.1 1. 1, uh -huh. and i didn't know what the heck what I, I was doing so i was holding mine at um you know if the paper is a clock i was holding my nib kind of at uh you know, four o'clock, yeah. you know, pointing toward the middle of the clock. Sure, sure. Um, but more four, three, like, you know, three o'clock, four o'clock. Hmm. So my writing kind of did look like that at, at first. But then the more I realized I could get a better variation of ups and downs, I started moving it to six o'clock. Very interesting. Yeah. Do you find you turn your hand more or do you turn the paper and like kind of keep your hand the same? Um, a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah, I don't put, I don't take my hand and go all the way over here. I'll take my hand, do that, and then take my paper and do that. Well, sometimes if I'm trying to get like a really extreme writing like that, not that I do it for a long period of time, but I'll like totally change how I hold it in my hand. So I'm not, I'm not actually changing like my hand position very much, but I'll, you know, instead of having my, here, can I see your pen real quick? Oh, this is a terrible pen as a demonstration because <laughs> it's tiny. But, you know, if I'm trying to write more up and down, I'll have it like way closer to my thumb. Uh -huh. And if I'm trying to write more from the side, I'll like hold it you know, yeah. almost so it's 90 degrees. So like my, just the way I hold it will be completely different. I definitely do that. Do, I can't, yeah. I can't tell you I've what seen, I, I've seen you do that before. Yeah. You do, you do some interesting things. Especially I definitely, when you're drawing. Your I switch it up like a lot. I can't, I can't tell you what I do, but I right, know I right. switch up my grip a lot. Yeah. It's just subconscious. You just practice. Yeah. yeah very interesting. Um, what about you? When do you, when do so, you like to break your mold and go straight up extra fine? Well, see, it's interesting. So like, this kind of segues from a couple questions earlier where like, I had a very limited pen budget. Mm -hmm. I really liked the variety of inks. Like most of my inks that I first started out using were Urban inks, which are not the most deeply saturated ink colors. Most of them are pretty light. So there's tons of shading. So I was really drawn to very wet broads, you know, 1.1, 1.5 stubs. Those were a lot of the ones that I really enjoyed early on. So I enjoyed having very high shading inks with very wet writing pens. So that was honestly most of my my draw. And and it just, to me, it looked so different to ballpoints and rollerballs. Mm -hmm. So like for me, fountain pens, it's like I could use much wilder, more interesting colors. I could use nib sizes that were just not anything you could replicate with a rollerball. Um, so I was so just, you know, I like, it was like going through the the wardrobe into Narnia. I was like, <laughs> I'm into fountain pens here. I got inks, I got nib sizes. I, I'm in a hold, you know, and then once I got into like really nice papers too, and it felt smooth, I was like, 
I want nothing to do with anything that can even be replicated with a rollerball. So I went way hard into like some of the extremes of what you get with fountain pens. Um, <clears throat> And of course, now this was this was 13 years ago. Now, four, almost 14 years ago, now the options you have with chromo shading inks and high sheeners and all this stuff, you know, shimmering inks, like you can get even further turbo Narnia, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. So that's super fun. So I still enjoy that, but I would say the times where I deviate more from that um, is in particular where I'm taking notes for a more utilitarian purpose. Yeah. Um, specifically, like if I'm traveling, going to a work conference or something like that, I really don't want some crazy stubby, high shading, something or other ink. Because, you know, first off, those things could be maybe slightly more temperamental or, or whatever, or you have to write so much bigger, you're gonna take up more, sp more space in your notebook or whatever. Um, and you so can I like to write, too. yeah, exactly. And then you might have to fill it more or whatever. Um, so I tend to be a little bit more utilitarian. So like now it's at the point where if I can travel and if I can bring like a Twisby 580, you know, that holds a pretty decent volume of ink and it's got a fine or an extra fine nib on it, I don't even have to bring ink with me. Like that thing's gonna last me a four day conference, yeah. you know, and I can take notes all day long and never run out of ink. You know, so I'll bring like a backup pen maybe, yeah. but I'm not, you so know. That's not so different than my opinion as far as extra it's, fines being good for utility. Yeah, it's it's not that different, but I probably just, I probably don't use, well, I don't know. I got to think about this a little bit because I just kind of do what I do. I didn't really thought that much about well, it. Well, you, you think about that. I'll mention another part that I forgot to mention. And if you are getting a fun nib ground, like we're talking architects or any sort of other you know, interesting nib customization or grind, there are way more possibilities when you start with a larger nib. That's true. Um, than yeah. when you start with an extra fine. So that's another uh, exception mm -hmm. that I will make. Is yeah, you can always grind finer, but you can't really add more on. Right. Very so easily. most of the fun custom nibs you'll find with interesting mm -hmm. grinds are going to be of the larger the yeah. sort. Yeah. 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 Like stacked nibs and stuff like that. Like. Extra fine, you're just not, that's not the realm where no. crazy nibs live. No, nah, pretty much unless you're going like needlepoint or like, you know, particular like hyperflex and stuff like that. Those are the only ones where like custom grinds with a really fine nib make any sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to kind of like summarize my stuff is like, I think I tend to use finer nibs when I'm like, especially if I'm using a five millimeter dot grid, you know, you can really pack a lot in there. It's going to dry faster. So if you're writing on the go, that's where it tends to be much more handy. So those all kind of pair up a finer nib pen with like a traveler's, you know, journal with, um, you know, like a five millimeter dot Goulet notebook. That's, that's, that's my go-to like travel. Like I literally, you know, have the same one I've been carrying for years. I think I have it right here. So I have like Lamy 2000 in here with, I think a fine nib and I just, you know, take all my notes in it. I have a couple different notebooks for different, you know, personal versus business, whatever. TCB. So I can just like kind of keep that around. It doesn't take up as much space. The pen is gonna last forever because it's not putting down that much ink. Yeah. But if I'm like wanting to get, if I'm wanting to write for the writing experience, yeah. primarily, I want the cool fat nibs with the crazy inks yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So we're, we're, we're pretty aligned we there. Are, we are pretty aligned. How about in that? Fact. How about that? Who knew? All right. You ready for the last one? I think so. Are you ready? Super pen related. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, D. Dot Dancing Queen hey says, "What music do you guys listen to?" Now, I think this is a loaded question because Dancing Queen obviously wants us to say well, ABBA. ABBA reference. <laughs> I mean, ABBA's cool. Um, it's one of my favorite episodes of Community. Is where they oh the, my god yes the Halloween episode where they Love the it. ABBA soundtrack on yes. the whole time. Um, I have a very eclectic music mix personally. Um, I have a musical background, so like I played many instruments. Um, I was in a military marching band in college. I was in a jazz band. You know, I played Barry Sax. I played sousaphone, bass guitar. Rachel and I both had the same bass guitar amp when we met. That was one of the things that we bonded over as 17 year old high school students. Um, you know, play guitar, play clarinet, bass clarinet, contrabass clarinet. Do you listen clarinet. to music that has those things? Most music doesn't have those. So some of those, like, yeah, bass guitar is pretty pretty easy. Contrabass clarinet, not so much. Not so much. Don't, don't see those so I much. Always, I can always pick it out, though, when I do hear it. I'm like, that's a contrabass clarinet right there. I can pick Obviously. it out. You cannot. I, yeah, absolutely. Can you really? I, can. You know, I played it for four, well, four I don't years. know. I've, yeah. I've 
Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I can. I mean, if I'm listening to like an entire orchestra, I can't be like, there's a bass. Clean. Right, right. But if like if there's a solo or something, or if there's like a few instruments playing, I'm like, I think I hear. Okay, okay. Because you know, I just I've heard it so much. Okay. Um. Anyway, so I played a bunch of different instruments. So I, I've I've listened to and played a whole bunch of different musical styles. You know, I'm a singer and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I love classical music. I love jazz. Um, you know, for like the instrumental kind of stuff. But I, I absolutely love classic rock and metal and hip hop and all kinds of stuff. You know, Salt and Pepper Shoop was the first album that I ever bought as a kid. I did not understand what that meant and what that album was all about, nor did my parents. I think I bought it when I was eight or nine. Nice. You know, and uh, anyway, that's kind of funny. Then my, then my second, cause this was a cassette tape back in the day. Mm-hmm. My second cassette tape was uh, Queen's Greatest Hits. So it's like right off the bat, super eclectic. And then yeah. I think I was, uh, um, what was the next one? Um, not Blink-182, but they were in that vein. Um, um, oh, shoot. What's that band? They're super popular. Um, the Kids Aren't All Right was one of their popular oh, songs. Oh, Offspring. Offspring. Yep. That, I think, was my third. Or maybe Bush no, was like no, my third album or these something. These are CDs, right? No, these are cassettes. You had an Offspring cassette? I had Offspring cassette. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And Bush as well. I were, remember Bush. You know, so, yeah. So, I was. I did grunge. I did, you know, all that stuff. I was, I'm into all of that. I never had real um, bands on cassette. I just had a bunch of soundtracks. I yeah? Like Ghostbusters and Ninja Turtles on cassette. I mean, that's cool, too. And then I had some records. I had some uh, 45s. Of, really? Uh, yeah, some Michael Jackson 45s and stuff right. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Those would be worth something. Well, I didn't buy them. I somehow acquired them. I don't know. Yard yeah. sale probably. Okay. That's cool though. Yeah, we Those had, are like super in now. We had Rock and Robin on there. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. So I've, I've, I'll listen to different things. I'm very, I'm, for me, I'm like, I don't just sit down and just like, I'm just going to like listen to music. Yeah. Music just kind of happens or I like put it on as part of the thing, like when I'm in a mood, mm-hmm. like when I'm, when I'm trying to suit the mood. So if I'm going to like, do yard work outside or like do a heavy workout or something i'll put on some like speed metal like something crazy or you know some some uh i'm trying to think of like some of the the halloween or something like that you know just like some (laughs) some operatic you know metal or whatever um but i also did like uh i had access to computers probably earlier than most because my parents had a business in the house where they had a lot of computers so i did like music looping like very early on so i got into like edm and dubstep and like that type of stuff i've always been fascinated by that just because of you know i like things with a driving beat um i like having sound systems in my car i had Mm -hmm. that in like high school and college and i installed one in my car over covid as i've shared on here so i'll listen to that stuff but then like if i'm working on stuff like I can't have stuff with like a big driving beat or or something like that if I'm like trying to actually work and concentrate. Like mm-hmm. if I'm trying to prep for a video, yeah. you know, or trying to script something or, you know, whatever, you know, going through like our financials or with our business. Like I can't be listening to, you know, Guns N' Roses on doing our financial model, you know. So I'll listen to like Bossa Nova or some kind of like spa, like chill music that's just like no words or lyrics or nothing in English, at least. If it has lyrics and it's in a foreign language and just kind of in the background, Mm -hmm. I can sort of tune it out. So it's like, you know, I definitely listen to a lot more music when I'm like trying to focus or do something. And it's like just kind of there in the background, Mm. but I'm not really like focusing hard on the music. Um, So yeah, very eclectic taste, Um, but. Um, yeah, so I probably listen to a, a little bit less music now. I listen to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts, um, a lot more of that because yeah, it's just the stage of life that I'm in. I'm like trying to maximize every minute I have, you know, so it's like I have interests in reading certain books and all that, but I'm like, I also have to do the dishes and mow the lawn. So I'll like, yeah, I'll listen to a podcast while I'm mowing and trimming and all that kind of stuff. So that's probably more what I do now. And then music is more just like when I'm like, all right, I truly just want something in the background. Mm-hmm. So. Do you ever, when you don't listen to music for a while, do you miss it? Um, yeah, maybe a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Because I don't. No? No, like I have a weird relationship with music the last, you know, you know, five plus years where mm. I, when I discovered podcasts, I kind of stopped listening to music in my car. And that was the only time I listened to music. Okay. Um, and Because I don't listen to music at home. And I don't listen to music in the office if I can't concentrate on but wow. one thing at a time. So okay. having background stuff is very rarely okay for me. Because Even if I, it's like the same song you've listened to a thousand times, is it still just as no, distracting? No, because then it brings or? back memories. Yeah, see, I can't, I yeah. can't do that. It's too, it's too distracting for me. I, I have huh. literally a one-track mind where huh. it is one hundred percent of one thing or the other. The only exception 
is when I'm working, if I'm doing something brainless like ink swabs or something like that, yeah, yeah. I will put on some Super Nintendo music from you on YouTube. Okay. Where I will listen to Super Nintendo soundtracks, uh, most notably Donkey Kong Country. Like that, that I can listen to Donkey Kong Country music all day long. I mean, long. that's a solid, solid music. It's amazing. Yeah. Um. So that just, it's so, you know, it's familiar, so it's soothing, but there's nothing that is going to, uh, yeah, it's just so, and it's so simple because it's just 16-bit yeah. video game MIDI, music. MIDI music, yeah. Yeah, um, so that I can do if I'm doing something at work that <laughs> is brainless. Um, but uh, yeah, in the car, I'm listening listening to audiobooks or uh, um, podcasts. Yeah. I, at home, even if I'm doing the dishes, I don't listen to music because my kid's trying to talk to me or and I don't have, I can't wear earbuds. They fall out of my ears. I've never had a pair of earbuds oh, that stay see, in my ears. That's the game changer for me. Yeah, so I do one, I'll do one earbud. I have never had a pair yeah. of earbuds that stayed in. Ever, really? And I've tried so many. Wow. I also don't like the feeling of it. I mean, I love it, but um, it's like. No, it drives me nuts. Uh, so yeah, but if, but when I do hear music, I get excited. Like I, there are, there's music that I'm very passionate about and I get oh, yeah. super jazzed up about it, but I just don't seek it out. And when it's not there, I don't miss it. So music doesn't occupy a very special place with me. And I know that sounds weird to a lot of people. Like, how could you just not really care about music? And I do, I've gone to plenty of concerts. I've seen many of my favorite bands, but when it's not there, I just don't miss it. So I, I don't I know. Say, you've probably been, a, I think you've been to way more concerts. Than yeah, I yeah, and yeah. I, I have, and I'm very passionate about the bands that I do love, but when they're when they're not b being played, I don't feel like there's an empty part of me. So, um, but that being right. said, two genres, it that's it for me. And that's yeah. 80, 80s like glam rock <laughs> and European power metal. Like that is it. I don't listen to it's anything so else. Specific. So you're talking like and video game music. And video game music, I do, yeah. I do. So no, we're, you're talking about like um, you know uh, Skid Row, White Snake, Van Halen, yeah. Survivor. Oh my god, I love Survivor, my mm -hmm. favorite band. So any of those '80s hair metal bands, give me some you know Bon Jovi or some Def Leppard. Yes, amen. Yeah. Um, and then European <laughs> power metal. You've got like Avantasia, Hammerfall, Halloween, like you said, yeah. Dragon Force, Glory Hammer, oh, Sabaton. Dragon oh my god, love that. Yeah. Love all those. those I, all day, all day long. Um, and uh, they just make me happy. Yeah. So I have no idea what any of them are about. <laughs> like lyrics do not matter to me at all. To right, me, right. to me, someone singing is just another instrument that's making. Yeah, it's just like rhythmic. Is, yeah, yeah. Right. I don't. I'm with so, you. Some people are like, oh yeah, this song is about this. Or did you, did you have? Did you catch it when you said this? But then said it again later. I'm like, nope. Yeah, I'm no kind of the same idea. way. Like I would buy albums when I was younger, and I would even read the lyrics, and I was just like, what are they talking about? And like other people talk about, oh yeah, this song means that, and I'm like. I'm not getting that at all. Like I'm just like not on that wavelength. My my brothers are it. both musicians. They play drum and bass and they jam together and stuff. And I'm always the odd man out because I'm A, I have no musical talent. <laughs> and B, I have no idea what songs are about. They're they are love they are into progressive rock. Okay. So to them, every album is a story. Mm. And and it is the meaning and the form and the unpredictable nature, but it's also kind of predictable. It's like they are just way into it. I'm just, it's yeah, all it's over like, my it's head. It's like different wavelengths. It's all yeah. over my head. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just not there. Fair enough. But uh, I do, I do. And I've, I've seen most of these live and it has been epic every single time. But uh, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm okay without it as well. All right, fair enough. But uh, now I will say when I'm doing like my VR gaming, <laughs> I have, you know, modded my, uh, Oculus so that I can add custom songs to all of these, you know, beat driven games. There's a game called Ragnarok that's like a Viking drumming game. <laughs> there's Beat Saber and then there's another one called Synth Riders where you've got these orbs. All three of them I have added custom songs into so that I have been able, I'm, I'm at least passionate. That's one. That's I'm one. passionate enough about the music so I want to hear all of my songs in these games. And okay. when I do, Oh man, like that's cool. Yeah, I was you know doing some uh, some Hammerfall on uh, Ragnarok the other day, and um, it was uh, Hearts on Fire. You know, <laughs> oh my god, yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> so awesome. much fun. That's cool. But so you're doing that like for the purpose of ex like experiencing that music. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but it, but I definitely like it enough that it adds an extra level of enjoyment to yeah, things yeah. I'm already doing. That's cool. Yeah, I dig it. I dig it. So that's that. Awesome. All right, we are going to try something new here. Yes. We've never done this before, have we? No, you two, have no idea what's about to I happen. I don't, but apparently we're going to do two truths and a lie. 
Okay, so this Two Truths and a Lie is Ferris Wheel Press Edition. Oh, oh boy. So, okay. Yes. Oh gosh, are you gonna like quiz me on my knowledge of uh, um, Ferris Wheel Press? In a way, okay. but also in a way not. All right. So hopefully this um, is easy. It, I don't it might like I know be. It well. might be. It might not be. But no, no these okay. are not inks we carry. So, oh boy. Okay. So what I've done because you know, well, Fer they go deep on the theming. They like, do. So so that's okay. I was I, I was at work last week and uh, our friend Brian K who works here I said you know what no I think he he made a comment about how Ferris wheel ink Ferris wheel press inks are so so crazy with their naming conventions mm -hmm. and he said you know you could probably just kind of find three words smushing them together and make a name I'm like actually you know what hang on so I made <laughs> up like, some, I could do that I, I made up some Ferris wheel press names and I mix them in because I still have that crate of you get on like a Ferris wheel press name generator. Yes, so I I generated some Ferris wheel press names. Oh boy! And I mixed them in okay. with real names that oh were inks that we chose not to carry, oh but boy. do exist. Okay. So you don't need to know anything about Ferris wheel press. You just need to be able to say this is the one you made up, Drew. Okay. So, I feel like this is gonna be tough. This is gonna be tough. Oh, it will be. Okay. Um, I've got four sets of three names. Okay. So we're going to go through all four sets. All right. I'm going to give you three names and you and one of the names is just a BS name that I made up. Okay. All right, you ready? Okay. Let's do it. The first one. Okay, we've got Apricot Autumn. Okay. Algonquin Maple or Frivolous Lime. One of those mm. is fake. I want to say Frivolous Lime. Is that your final answer? It sounds like a word that you would use. Frivolous. That is a real ink. Get out of here. Frivolous, Frivolous lime. Is, lime. That is a real Ferris wheel press As ink. As opposed my to friend. like purposeful lime. Right. Apricot <laughs> autumn is the one I came up with. That sounds like an incredibly legit, <laughs> right? like literally could have been a color. Yes. Wow. Okay. All right. All right. Good. All right. O for one. Next I one. I feel like I'm going to go O for four on this. Um, Brian got <laughs> all but one right. Wow. Um, okay, great. But this one, this <laughs> this one I edited from the one I gave him because mine was just too stupid. Okay. All right. Misguided mistletoe. Oh boy. Grape ice pop. Raindrop parade. Mm. Misguided mistletoe. Grape ice pop. Raindrop parade. I want to say grape pop. That is a real ink. Get Jeez. <laughs> I told you I was going to be bad at this. This is the first one. Raindrop Parade is the oh, one I made it. I was going to say this first one. Okay. I really don't know these Raindrop at all. Raindrop Parade. What does that even mean? I don't know. What is misguided mistletoe? <laughs> They're all silly. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Okay. Okay. Oh, I love it's all it. It's all like me, like music lyrics. Like, I don't, I know. I don't it, understand well, what songs are about. That's why it's funny because none of these names really make a lot of sense. I mean, I feel like they could make sense. I just don't get it. Raindrop but. Parade. What color is that? You know what? We need to make an exclusive. After this, we need to pick one of these and make an exclusive Ferris wheel press inks. Like, oh, yeah. wow. Okay. How about, we're going to call this Raindrop Parade. You just picked the color wow. Ferris wheel press. We're just going to. Okay. <laughs> Apricot Autumn. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. Yep. Over two. Yep. Okay. We got two more rounds to go. Okay. Definitely peachy. Mm -hmm. Terrace twilight. Freshly squeezed sunshine. <laughs> I want to say freshly squeezed sunshine. Are you going to say it? But I have no confidence now All in right. my ability Definite, to pick. Definitely peachy. <sighs> Terrace twilight. Freshly squeezed sunshine. I'm going to go with my gut. Freshly squeezed sunshine. That's an actual ink. Of course it is. <laughs> Is it the Terrace one? Yeah. Okay. That terrace was like my toilet. back one. I, I mean, like, what is that? I don't know. But it's freshly squeezed sunshine. <laughs> terrace Twilight makes more sound like, oh, you're out on a terrace and it's nighttime. Whatever. I don't know. That was probably my favorite in here that sounds most like an existing Ferris wheel press You know what it is? Ink. It's the alliteration. I was like, that's got good alliteration. Yeah. That must be real. Yeah. Maybe, so, that's the, maybe that's the one we need to make, Drew. Terrace, terrace Twilight. Twilight. Yep. Okay. One more. This is your chance, buddy. Oh, boy. Wondrous Winterberry. Frosted Apple Bloom, Madam Mulberry. <sighs> Wondrous Winterberry, Frosted Apple Bloom, Madam Mulberry. None of these sound real. Mm. One mm. of them is less real than the others. <laughs> Madam Mulberry? Is that is one? a real ink. Tag gone it. <laughs> over four. I told you I was going to go over four. Frost, What's the... Frosted Apple Bloom. I don't like what is an apple bloom? I don't know. It's like a know. mispronunciation of Apple Boom. Yeah. Oh maybe. my God. 
Yep. So there you have what it. What was the first one that you had? That Wondrous one? Winterberry. What's a Winterberry? I don't know, but it's a real ink. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh, Madam man. Madam Mulberry. You know what I was thinking of? I was thinking of Veggie Tales. That's why I was thinking. <laughs> oh, God. Of, I was thinking of Madam Blueberry. That's what I was thinking of. I was like, that sounds too oh, That doesn't sound real. Definitely peachy. Wow. Oh. So there you I go. Mean, to be clear, I'm not making fun of these names or anything. I'm no, just, they're I'm, just I'm, I'm, I'm impressed at my inability to tell any of these Maybe apart. you should be impressed by my ability to create you, you wonderful did, Ferris you, wheel press names. I don't know what it says. They should hire that me. You fooled me on this because I don't know what. How, well, no, none of these are ones that we carry, so you shouldn't know them. These I are I've never heard of. These any are all of the these. these are all the ones that we okay. They're, they're all in the original line that we were like. Let's not start with these. Yeah, these so, were all like released before we carried the brand, yeah, right? So yeah. like, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have like no no, no yeah you weren't expected to know. These. I I picked these because I didn't want you to already know them because then you'd definitely so, be able to pick my fake ones. I'm still pretty bad. Like even with most of our other brands, like recalling exact ink names. Oh well, still if I if I I'm, gave you, I'm not great. if it's I used like, ones we already had, you would have been able to guess. Like you would have been uh, able maybe. to maybe. I don't know that I would. <laughs> Like, it's impressive how poorly I remember verbal like things, like words to songs that I've sung my entire life. I yeah. cannot recall. Oh yeah, wasn't it like it is like a major hole in my brain? What was? Wasn't it a Christmas song that you? Oh yeah, like oh well, I auditioned the Star Spangled Banner. I was a cadet at Virginia Tech, auditioning for an acapella group, and I didn't. To be fair, I was very busy, but I didn't properly prepare for the audition. And they just asked me to sing a song from memory. And I was like, oh, what? I was like, crap, what can I sing from memory? I was like, Star Spangled Banner. I'm sure I can wing it. Nope. Forgot the words in the middle of it. They literally laughed me out of the room. Oh, Because I'm like a cadet. I'm like ripped. Yeah. High and tight haircut. Oh. Can't even sing the Star Spangled Banner. Man. And that's where I was like, yeah, it's probably better that I'm not in this group because I would not be able to memorize the lyrics. Mm -hmm. So it is just a, for as many things as I can do well. Yeah. I do that worse than anything else. Didn't you, want, didn't you say like you had a hard time with like Jingle Bells or something? I can't memorize anything. Yeah. I can't sing a single song all the way through. Not a single one. It's impressive how poorly I can remember words. I got, I, I recently <laughs> got, have you have you heard that like, you know, modern sea shanty on, you know, Instagram and TikTok, like there once was a ship that put to sea in there? No. I heard that that was like a COVID thing that like sea shanties became yeah, more popular. Yeah, I memorized that whole thing. Really? Just because I just stuck in my brain so much. <laughs> I have the whole thing in there now, wow. word for word. All right. Like. Good for you. Sometimes I'll just sing it in the car. I'm like, oh my God, that was all wow. of it. Wow. I. I can't sing a single song all the way through. It's yeah. it's truly debilitating and like frustrating. I wish I could because I can memorize music easily. My brain words I can't. My brain tells me what it's going to memorize. I don't you tell don't get, it. Is. You don't get to choose. No, it. I don't get to choose. That's Sometimes it wonderful. does though. Sometimes it does though, and it stays there forever. But nice, but it you, might not be helpful. I, I have no I have no say in the matter. No. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, all right. Well, that was fun, Drew. Spot pen light is next. Fun. Oh yeah. It says Pen Spotlight. I know you said it backwards. But pen, yeah. Pen Spotlight. Let's talk about the ST DuPont Line D. All right. All right, Drew. Let's you, check it out. You brought me out of Line D here. Didn't I you? did. Yeah. I figured we should talk about ST DuPont. We haven't done an ST DuPont um, Pen Spotlight yet. We haven't. I've done a couple of videos on them on the Line Ds. I did one when we first picked up the brand, and then um, when the uh, newer like Guyosh. Gioche ones came out. Yeah. So what do you got for me here? Oh, this the, is the, the gold, gold dust. dust. Yes. Yeah, so very goldy and dusty. Okay. Fair enough. Now this is a brand that like, honestly, like we picked them up. They changed distributorship. They were previously distributed by Davidoff, which is like a cigar like distributor. Yeah. Because and lighters are kind of their bread and butter. Yeah. Yeah. So they they make really nice pens. They make really nice lighters. Um, so they were really kind of underrepresented. They, from what I understand, they were much more known in the U.S. at least before we like before we were around. Um, then they were distributed by Davidoff for about 10 years. They really prioritized the cigar lighters. Nothing about the pens. Right. So this brand really kind of went under the radar and then they changed distributorship. Now they're Coles of London, who also distributes Visconti and they've been giving it a lot more, you know, proper attention, I'll say. So we, uh, we have a good relationship with them and they kind of, you know, asked us like, Hey, can you guys take a look at the, the ST DuPonts? And they've, you know, to be fair, they have changed up some of their designs a little bit and are catering more to, I would call fountain pen enthusiasts than they were before. Yeah. And, um, but it was like right when COVID hit and it, they hit them hard in France. So 
I still feel like we haven't really seen what STU DuBont's intended to do or mm-hmm. what they're capable of doing. Um, but they make all kinds of stuff. It's not just pens. I mean, they make all kinds of leather goods and stuff like that. Like they're actually a fairly, fairly sizable company. And all made in France. It is made in France. Yeah, exactly. So turn that nib to the side. That's one of my favorite things about these pens. Like the, yeah, the shape of the nib. Like it's got this, this, you know, they make these, um, I think are they Bach made or do they make these in-house? I, can't I thought remember. they I made them say, in-house. I can't remember. I think they might be Bach, but either way, they're custom to their brand. Yeah. What I um, like is that they almost completely obscure the feed when you're looking at it yeah, at the, the profile. The feed is very like... It's, it's very, very shallow. It's very tight to the nib and it really hugs up under there. Yeah. Um, it performs really well. Like the nib is bouncy. It's very smooth. Um, in particular, I love the mediums and broads of this. Oh, they write like a dream. Um, but the pen is very substantial. Like it feels like, you know, when you have like really nice German made pens, like it, the click is very tight, very, very crisp. The fit and finish is, I mean, second to none. Like you're, it's, they're expensive pens and you understand why as yeah. soon as you hold them in your hand. The, the, the thing that always trips me up is that visually you cannot convey the feel of this pen. And we do, it a, is difficult. I, I yeah. feel like we do a great job in conveying like how it snaps on the back there oh too. yeah it's beautiful it snaps on the back but also it's it's still kind of tight like you can rotate it but it it's, it's not going to rotate it's not on like its own. slipping around yeah like it's just very, it's very thoughtful now the pen's a bit it's a bit heavy because it's metal um and this this is a yurushi lacquer finish yeah and then they've got you know this like glitter in here basically um that's, but they, they do lacquer pen. really well it's one of their they do one of the things that they're known for yeah they're only like the only like non-japanese lacquer that i know that they're making it on a regular basis yeah but the build quality of these is really outstanding yeah and it's a shame that you know, you can't just reach through the screen and feel one of these things because when you do have it in your hand, Things you can tell there. why it is priced the way it is. Yeah. And everybody I know that has an ST DuPont absolutely loves them, but yeah. they still are not what I would consider a popular brand. Yeah, exactly. Well, and part of that is like they, I mean, they just came out with the Defi, which is the most affordable of their pens. But you're still over three hundred dollars. Let's that. take a look at that um, it's uh, spring, D on the spring finial there. clip. Oh yeah, take it the so it's got the logo. It's like it's under it's the really lacquer. Nice. Yeah, it's under the. I don't know if it's lacquer on the top there or what or what that is, but it's like very three dimensional looking. Um, and then like they always have this diamond or this like uh, shield. shield like shield type shape, and I like the shape of the clip too. Um, it's got character to it, but it's also still pretty subtle. And it's it's got a spring clip very on it. Very functional as well. Yeah, yeah, very functional, strong. Um, and the lacquer's yeah. strong too. The lacquer, while oh, it yeah. looks polished and you know very executive, I mean, lacquer yeah, is a very, very strong durable. material. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, overall very good pen. I mean, it's got they always have the metal grips, which you know some people maybe don't love as much. And it's got a little bit of texture to it, but with the texture, I think it's less bothersome. Because it's not like like the I think of like the Twisby 580 ALR, where it's got a rib texture, but it's going, you know, around the diameter yeah. of the pen. These are like fluted, so uh, you know it's rare that you're like twisting your fingers around it yeah. to where you're going to feel no, that's it. Fine. And there's a nice you know, stop there at the end too. Yeah, so I think in terms of having like metal grip pens, this one is you know, of the lesser offensive <laughs> for those who, who don't like those slick metal grips. For sure. And it takes um, a standard international converter, right? Yeah, it does. It does. So, um, but they've got an O-ring on here. I don't have the, this just came out of the box. So it's got the, the cartridge in here. Standard international, short cartridge. Yeah, I guess it's got the, what, the converter in here somewhere. Yeah. So standard international just kind of fits onto the back. Do, do, do. You know, do your fill, fits on there. It's got are these nice O-ring? Are these wet riders in your experience? I think they're a little bit on the wetter side. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you know that's like the mediums and the broads are definitely wet. The the finer, yeah, I, th- I think they tend to be a little on the wet riding side. So, um, you know, more traditional, what you would consider to be like European style or Western style nibs than your uh, than you would get with your Japanese pens. So, anyway, really nice pens. You know, thanks for bringing this up, Drew. I think we wanted to just feature it a little bit because it's not a pen that gets talked about quite as much because no. I think because of the price point yeah. and because of the, just the brand recognition, it's not one that as many people are, are familiar with and talking about quite as much, but I wanted to give it a little love. Yeah, it's it's 
It's what I would say is that if someone happens to be considering a brand like Visconti, which has pens in this price range, sure, um, there's no reason they should not also consider St. Dupont. Yeah, if you're considering a Montegrappa, a Penider, or a Visconti that is in the you know low thousand dollar range, like you know a thousand dollars to fifteen hundred dollars, which is a very expensive pen, but there are also other pens that sell way more than SU DuPont does at those price points. Like those same people in that mm -hmm. same market should absolutely be considering SU DuPont in my opinion. Yeah. Like, absolutely. That should be in the mix. It should be right there in discussion with everything else in that price range for sure. And I don't think it is. I really don't think it is. And I think that's a shame because mm -hmm. it is as good or better than a lot of other pens in that realm. I agree. I agree. Cool. Well, anyway, if you have any questions, uh, leave them down in the comments or go check out ST DuPont on our site. Um, and we'll, uh, I think they're, they're supposed to be coming out with some new stuff this year. So yep. we'll uh, let you all know when that happens. We'll have some brand new stuff that we talked about uh, earlier. That's those, right. Those, uh, all the, those yeah. New, yeah, and all those new things that I alluded to that. Uh, oh, yes. Is non specific. Yes, around. all of it those 2023 things. Just lump it into that category. Why not? Very cool. All right, what do we got next, Drew? Oh, what's happening? Let's, let's uh, talk about nonsense now. What is happening? What is happening? Oh, well, I'll tell you. Lots well, happening. Um, we got two weeks to cover now. Yeah, we did have two weeks to cover. Um, <clears throat> I run about an hour and a half, so we can't go yeah. like a full hour on the what's yeah, happening this for sure. week. Um, well, I'll be quick. <laughs> um, my wife had a show, a little local theater production, where she and a bunch of other ladies did just some like ladies Broadway numbers. So yeah. um, Archer and I attended that um, this past oh. weekend. And then once that show had concluded, she and um, uh, her cast came over to our house for a little cast party after everything had concluded. So she was doing her show. So I was at home prepping for the event. Ooh. So we just had like snack fair. Um, yeah, so yeah. I just kind of got that out. We got bought a charcuterie tray from Costco. So it had all the stuff there. Nice. It just needed to be arranged all pretty. Okay. So. I did that to the best of my abilities, you know, made some uh, pigs in the blanket, did the did the whole Pillsbury Crescent yes. thing, rolled a bunch of those. I'm into, uh, I'm into those. They were the most popular thing by yeah. far. Yeah, because they're the best. Uh, we we made some, we heated up some pizza rolls, some Totino's oh, wow. pizza rolls. Like All right. there were there was some there was some nice <laughs> stuff, but like as far as like staples, like pizza rolls and. Pigs yeah. in a blanket, man. Yeah. People just ate them up. It was just like a chat and everybody else brought wine. Mm -hmm. It was funny that no one expected us to have a wine, uh, uh, what's the corkscrew? Um, <laughs> because we don't drink. Right. So right. everybody brought wine with screw tops. <laughs> We're like, no, we have, we, we entertain. We have friends that yeah, drink. You're not so like against drinking. No, we, we just, just don't, don't do it. it yeah. Yourselves. So yeah. everybody's like, oh, okay. Well, I didn't know. I just wanted to make sure. So that was kind of funny. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> um, so that was fun to have everybody over. Um, Archer wanted to take everybody on tour. So he was a little pushy about that. He kept on bringing out sign that said free tour and everybody just kind of ignored him. And then he brought up another sign that said, seriously, it's free. And then still nobody annoyed him. And then he had wasn't, another. Wasn't the price that was the the barrier? On no. That and one. then he brought out a third one that says like, "Guys, seriously, it's a free tour." S a frowny face, frowny face, <laughs> frowny face. I'm like, dude, you're getting a little Ooh, aggressive, buddy. Yeah. Calm down. So we did that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I uh, we had all of the rugs pulled up because Hank, our newest corgi, has been marking. So all of our, um, we bought ruggables. So they're the wash, the machine washable rugs okay. with like the base layer. So there's like a, a base black layer that the rug sits on top of. It's kind of like, it kind of Velcros it to the, to the non-slip mat. Okay. So you lay down the base layer and then you kind of roll on the actual carpet part. Okay. It's kind of annoying, especially if you've washed the carpet as many times as we have, it yeah. shrinks up a little bit. Mm. So you don't have any margin of error for putting it on the base because uh -huh. the base doesn't shrink. It's just rubber and plastic. Right, right. So you have to get it perfect, the whole thing. And this is like a five by eight rug. Oh, wow. Um, so it- And you wash that thing like in the washing machine? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty thin. Okay. It's not super- Okay. It's like, yeah. So anyway, every time I put this thing down, our older dog, Dinah, she's like 12 years old, just sits there. So I have the black pad down and I'm yeah. rolling the carpet on and she just sits there on the black pad, just like, <laughs> doesn't move every single time like clockwork like the whole house you have to sit right there you know i'm trying like to do a, this like an and npc she, in a video and she game just looks at me like, like hey what you doing and <laughs> every time but anyway so we did that the rugs are still there but i know they're gonna have to come up soon because mm -hmm. one dog is gonna be mm -hmm. bad about it uh we got our hair cut me and archer um mm -hmm. 
got our haircut on Saturday. Shannon made the appointment, didn't tell me the right time. We got there 30 minutes earlier, but um, we went over to a bubble tea place, which is right across from uh, Bricks and Minifigs where you're yeah, at. We went to Kung yeah. Fu Tea. And uh, this was my second try getting bubble tea. The first time I hated it. It was like the little bubbles were like kind of sticky. I, I didn't, not what I expected. So mm. this time I ordered it with like um, squishy bubbles, like coffee filled flavor, um, juicy, bursty bubbles. Are they kind of like the little poppers yes, that you get? Yes, exactly. Like sweet frogs? Exactly yeah. the same thing. Okay. And it was so much better. Huh. So I got this like gingerbread tea. It was amazing, wonderful, uh-huh. delightful. I'll have um, to check that out. Yeah, and Archer got something with little pineapple squishy nuggets in there. I don't know. I don't know about bubble tea, but it was good. Um, I'm sure pineapple squishy nuggets is yeah, definitely pineapple the squishy right nuggets. Term, yeah. Um, the week prior, we went to our friend Michael and Brittany's house with their two young girls, had dinner, had some tacos there. Uh, they have a bunny. I got to play with the bunny. That made me really happy. Okay. Because I like bunnies. I read a book on uh, uh, on bunnies. They're they're quirky animals. They to, are. To keep well, as pets. I was going to get one, and then the the bunny lady says, "That's great, sounds good. You have to read this book before I will give you, you a bunny. To, you need to know what you're getting into." Yes. So yeah. I'm like, okay, fair enough. So I re- got the book, read the book, and I said, nope, not for me. Bunnies are not for me. Yeah. But I love living vicariously through other bunny owners. So I got to play with the bunny. Okay. That was great. Archer got to play with the little girls. That was fun. We had a good time. Um, and then Michael showed me all of his random guitar projects. You know Michael; he's a he likes oh, uh, yeah. he likes guitars. Yeah. Um, and then uh, let's see that also that same weekend we uh, went over to my brother's house. We watched the UFC event, and I gave my brothers their late Christmas gifts. Um, I got Chad a uh, pillow because he's a fidgeter; mm. he picks his nails. He's terrible. So I got him a sensory pillow that has that looks like a knot. Huh. So he can like stick his hands in there and fiddle with it. He always has like a lap pillow wherever, whenever he's okay. watching a movie or something, he always has a pillow in his lap just to okay. hold. So yeah, great gift for him. Well, that's cool. And uh, my other brother, I got him a, uh, do you remember Lord Zed from Power Rangers? I do. Got him a Lord Zed helmet. <laughs> Full wow. voice changing <laughs> Get out of here. Lord Zed helmet. Wow. And I, I handed it to him. I was like, all right, this is for 1995, Zach. Wow. And I handed it to him. And he was like, oh, my God. Like, he used to, <laughs> he had a little Lord's at action figure. He used to make a throne out of Legos and put him on. He, wow. He didn't care about the Power Rangers. He, he's a he's a villain kid all the way. Wow. So I'm like, I cannot not get this for him. Like, because <laughs> That's really funny. My, the little kid version of myself wouldn't um, allow it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Saturday night, I watched wrestling. Like, Old school. I wrestling? watched pro wrestling. I watched WWE. Okay. Which I have not watched since the early 2000s. Wow. Like at all. No. Well, you've watched UFC. Like it's not like you haven't watched fighting, but. Right. This is it's very different. Yeah. The UFC yeah. is actual, an actual sport. Like <laughs> wrestling. Yeah. Wrestling is, is more like you're watching a, a, yeah. a show. But they had the Royal Rumble, which is the, okay. which is the one time a year they have this big thing where the only way, like they have. A different wrestler come in every three minutes. Okay. It's just a big old mess. And the only way someone can be eliminated is by being thrown over the top rope. <laughs> so I didn't know who anybody was. Okay. But it was, was all these different like yeah, personas and I characters. Hadn't seen, I hadn't yeah. watched it since like 2004. Yeah. So, um, but I recognize a few people, you yeah. know, and I, don't, I see some things on Instagram. I'm like, oh yeah, that guy doesn't like this guy, I think. And, hmm. But one thing I saw was, do you know Logan Paul from YouTube? I'm familiar. He was there and um, okay. wrestling. And he and this other guy jumped up on the ropes, not like the corners where people normally jump off of, hmm. but the middle of the ropes and both jumped onto the middle of the ropes and then jumped into the air at each other and just collided in midair. That's like a pretty good distance, right? Yes. Like, as it's, like as it's happening, big. I'm watching. I'm like, okay, well, they're not going to reach each other. And they kept going and kept going. I'm like, oh my God. And then boom. So actually, that was a pretty fun watch. Wow. Yeah. So... I did that. Don't regret it. Not going to continue watching it, but that was a fun little Saturday night for me. Shannon okay. wasn't around, so I was like, "All right, why not?" Everything it's all free on Peacock now. Oh, like all the you don't okay. have to buy pay per views or anything. Yeah, because I was going to say normally don't you have to like subscribe or whatever nope. the heck? Okay, no. Nope. And then finally, what I'll say is uh, I'm doing a video this week on some inks, so mm-hmm. I needed to write off another glass pen for me. Um, yeah. And, Aren't you um, using like a broken one? I right was now? using a broken one, yes. And <laughs> like the I'm, back and, is broken off. Right, the back is broken. But I was like, okay, it's perfectly functional for yeah. if I'm doing writing samples for the photography. Yeah, it's, but, like a, it's like a pocket glass. But pen. for a, yeah, God, <laughs> before a, a video, like I'm not going to use a you know broken glass pen. I'm like, yeah, well, I, I need to that. present. Yeah. 
So um, wrote off a new one, went back to go get it, and I'm telling Micah why I needed a new one. I was yeah. like, because because I broke mine, and you know I can't be riding with a shard of glass. And as I said, shard of glass, I just flung it onto the concrete. <laughs> the new one. The new one. Wow. And broke it. Broke it. Shattered it. Wow. Into the exact same shape <laughs> as the one I have. <laughs> that is irony right there. The wow. moment I said shard of glass, I just... Just flung it and broke it. So I just fell over and okay. I, like, I just need to be done with everything <laughs> so i had to ask i mean they're pretty cheap so i know but it's only 25 bucks i'm not i mean not in the grand nothing. scheme of things i know you know thank you i appreciate that <laughs> you know it could, could be worse I appreciate it's not that. like you dropped an emperor on the ground i know, you know but oh my god so i had to go back to my back to my computer write another one <laughs> off go get another open that one at my desk <laughs> yeah don't fling it around god. <laughs> so now in my drawer i have two front ends of glass pens. I mean, they still function, right? Like, right. I'm going to keep right. them both because you, yeah. with glass pens, you never really know what the width is going to be. That's true. It is so, kind of random, yeah. You know, maybe maybe I'll have a medium and a broad. I don't know. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, that definitely happened just now. Wow, that's that's really funny. So I had to get the big broom out of the janitor's closet and kind of go, which was kind of fun, the big broom with the <laughs> I <haven't laughs> a teeny little thing. I haven't yeah. used one of those for a while. Yeah. I want to be extra safe, not going to leave well, any glass Well, I appreciate shards. that, yeah. Yep. Not leaving glass shards all over yep. them. All right, that's my that's my what's happening. Boom. Wow, okay. Rapid fire. That's a lot of random things that you've been up to. Yes. Um. So, yeah, I mentioned had COVID. I, I was asymptomatic, so I would not honestly have known. But we were You were so, real tired, though. I was real tired, but I've been real tired anyway because, like, middle age and stress and <laughs> chronic fatigue probably um i'm seeing some doctors but you know there's probably something so but it's still it was not like anything out of the ordinary mm. for other things that's how it was for me and yeah. like it's been three years of like oh, i think i'm feeling sick or we've got family coming into town let me go ahead and test yeah oh, okay i'm negative you know so it was the same kind of thing except this time it was like oh crap it like, finally happened positive and rachel was way sicker than me she had tested negative like multiple times but then we had family coming into town, just like strolling through for the night, you know, stopping by like as they were driving from like Georgia to New York or whatever. So I was like, oh, they can stop at our place, spend the night, whatever. And we're like, okay, we'll go ahead and test, just being proactive or whatever. And Rachel had, you know, already tested negative multiple times. And then she tested and she was positive. And I was like, well, let me test too. I was like, I'm definitely been exposed, you know, and I tested positive too. And I was like, great. Okay. And then Ellie ended up getting it. Joseph didn't. He missed it. This whole time. So we, I mean, he was like super at him. He was like, want to be masked. And we ate dinner like far away from him and everything. And so it was like a while of distancing in our own house, which was weird. But, you know, you do what you got to do. Yeah, that's what it was and, uh, with us. Yeah, yep. So all things considered, it wasn't that bad for us, thankfully. Um, and I think we're like the last in our whole extended family to get it. Um, and so, well, now we got it. But thankfully, we uh, didn't get it too bad. Um, but it did give us lots of time at home, lots of family time. Thankfully, we're very used to the remote working thing. That's so it's kind of like, all right, flip into that mode. Um, but Rachel is like much more sick than I was. So I went into like, okay, I'll, I'll cook dinner. I'll, you know, cause we couldn't like go to restaurants or any of that kind of stuff. You know, we did like some food pickup type things, but even still, so it was like, I, while I wasn't as sick, I was a little fatigued, but I was doing like a lot of the cleaning and the cooking and the, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was tired just from like all the extra family yeah. stuff that I was doing. Yeah, it can be exhausting. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. But all all in all, we're, we're doing great. Um, but uh, we did a little bit of uh, retro gaming <gasps> stuff. Speaking my language. We got, a, we got a switch and uh, we did some Mario Party 2 which was on the N64. Oh, okay. So going way back. I've never and played a Mario Party game. Really? No. See. I didn't have a lot of games for my 64. Okay, well, that's fair. And I mean, then and then since then, I haven't owned a Nintendo console since. Well, no, I get a, I did own a GameCube. I had two games. I mean, it's not like, it's not the kind of thing that like hardcore gamers play. Yeah. You know, it's like Rachel introduced me to like the Mario Party series and then I played it with her sister and all that. But like, I think Mario Party 2 was like the first like Mario Party thing that we played together. Mm -hmm. And now there's like, 10 or 14 of them or something like that. And that's what Nintendo so, be doing. like literally it was kind of like time traveling, like listening, like all the same music and the sound effects and all that. It was like, oh my gosh. Like, oh, I remember this game. Oh yeah, I'm terrible at this one. And I just got destroyed. Um, but we played it like with our kids, 
So they've played like the newer ones, but to, the, to them to play like the retro and you're watching like, oh, these graphics are terrible. But like you thought it was so amazing at the time. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Played Mario Party 2. Played some uh, 007 GoldenEye as well because they just re-released that I saw for the that. Switch. I saw that. So we fired that up and played it remotely with Rachel's sister. Nice. Which was also fun. Who's your GoldenEye character? Um, Did you have one? I don't really have a go-to character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are all kind of blocky and the same. Unless you go with <laughs> Jaws and Jaws and Odd Job were the only ones. That yeah, like I started off as Odd Job until we found out that he was a cheater, so I just I switched to. Uh, yeah, Odd Job's shorter than everybody else. Yeah, so I switched you, to yeah. Dimitri Mishkin. Okay, fair enough. But I then we would also, hop around. Yeah. We would also do this game where I would play as Jaws, and mm-hmm. um, just, He's just like go big, around big slapping target. people, yeah. but only at the in the helipad at the facility level. So my brothers <laughs> would have to go up, and I'd be there, and I'd just have to just run at him slapping them. <laughs> But I'd also like flick the control around, so it was just kind of like spasming everywhere, nice. and yeah, um, yeah, See, just freaking out. And we were doing it, but we were doing it with like the Switch controller, and some of the controls are slightly different. Mm-hmm. So we They're were better, like, I'm sure, just trying to. Well, in some ways, we were trying to like remember how to do it, but the the the, the does it actually have two joystick controls? It does. It so, does. Oh, so you don't have to strafe with the buttons anymore? Correct. Oh, that's handy. But the but it, it did it wasn't like clean. It wasn't like they were doing both at the same time, really. Oh. So so it was it was it was non elegant. Like uh, I remember doing it, and I was like, I was like, you know what yeah, I'm trying to do. It's, but it's not, not really. It's not quite. I working. still I still have it on 64 and with my 64. Yeah, um, and I think maybe that's just how the game was. It's not a fun game to play anymore. No, it really is pain, not. It's kind of painful. Right. It is. It is not a, like it, there, it's nostalgic. Yeah, but it's not one of those like that generation of games, PS1 and N64, yeah. heavy on the t- nostalgia. Going back and actually playing them. Yeah. It's pretty clunky. Like playing it's, like old uh, Mario Kart versions and stuff yeah. like that. You're just like, ugh, I feel yeah. kind of sick. It's like it, it, they're in a weird. Kind of nauseous. <laughs> because that's when that's when games start tried a little too hard to look good. Like Goldeneye was trying to look realistic. Well, yeah, they were. They, they were mean, trying was, to look photorealistic. It was, it was cutting edge at the time. But nobody tried to do that with like Genesis and Super Nintendo. No. But the next generation, they mm-hmm. tried. And yeah. now it's just like. Mm. Yeah, it was like you, you sort of reached that uncanny valley yeah. where you were like. Yeah, we're like not quite there. Like video games now, you're like, I feel like I'm watching a friggin' movie. Yeah, like this exactly. is unbelievable. But during that time, you know, it's funny now because my kids are, you know, 11 and 13. So they're in like full snark mode. So oh. they, they love going into like nostalgic stuff that mm-hmm. Rachel and I were into and just making fun of oh, it. Oh, Archer does the same thing. Yeah. I mean, he'll be like, I'm playing a brand new AAA title. I'm playing Ghost of Tsushima. And he's saying like, oh, look, his sword's glitching through his cape. I'm like, bro, you play Roblox. Right. <laughs> Don't even. Right. Have you even looked at your games? Shut up. Like, yeah, God, exactly. I don't tell him to shut up. But still, I'm like, dude. In your head, you do. You don't talk to me about <laughs> the cape going through the sword. When you right. play a giant square jumping over other giant square-ish things. Yeah. Like, Shh. I don't like Roblox. Quiet you. Um, we also got a, uh, you know, continue playing chess with the kids. Ah. Um, got a chess clock. So like the separate, so we can like. Oh, oh, gotcha. You okay. know, it's like a separate device. Yes. I had like one on my phone, but it was like, this is weird. So like, this one this you is, can go bam. Yeah. So you have like the switch on the top and all that kind of stuff. It, but I, the thing I like about the clock, you know, is I can give myself a different time than I give my kids. Oh. So it's sort of like equalizes. I can give them like, if we're trying to play a quicker game, I can give them like five minutes, eight minutes, whatever. I can give myself like three minutes. So like- Eight minutes to choose a move? Well, total. So like each time you hit it, it starts your time. And then, you know, when you hit it oh, again, oh, it, gets, oh, okay. it switches to them. And oh, all that. okay. Not eight minutes per turn. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, 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 total, okay, total. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. No. Well, when they do like tournaments and stuff, like they can do some really, really long, but that's like grandmasters and stuff. Um, you can play all kinds of different versions and stuff. Getting into timing with chess is like a whole other thing, which I never, I never learned any of that. Did chess? So this take is all the, new to me. Did chess take the place of your cubing? No, I still do cubing. You do, do okay? Cubing. Yeah, but chess is interactive. Like cubing, I just do myself. Mm-hmm. So the chess thing, I do like with my kids, and it's interactive. Um, so that's just been another dynamic. But it's, you know, it's not like a world of difference. No, you know, it, it does. Still, it does seem to kind of like it's still a similar brain function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pro, pro, the, the the cubing thing is more tactile though. Like yeah, chess like you're touching pieces, but it's a lot more mental. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the the cubing thing is more visual and tactile. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but yeah, that's been fun. So been doing the chess clock thing. So it's actually been really good because I've been playing and practicing more. My kids play, but they're not as into it as I am. 
shockingly. Um, so I, it started out where I was super rusty and they were able to beat me a little bit and now it's not been as much. But with giving myself less time, right. I make more mistakes. So it helps to equalize it and they're having a lot more fun. Nice. Um, yeah, so that's been fun. That is um, good. So that's been a nice little element. Um, I read a couple of books recently. I read, um, remember the book uh, Essentialism by Greg McKeown? I never read that one, but I've heard you I've speak talked about, about it a lot. Yeah. Well, he came out with a follow-up book called Effortless um, by Greg McEwen. So I read that one. It's very good. Um, and then I read a classic, a um, um, not a nonfiction book, which I, you know me, I pretty much only read nonfiction. Yeah. So it was an audio book, if you consider that reading. That's yeah. I do. If you don't, I read, then I read uh, nothing. Yeah, I read uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. Oh, yeah. Which I've heard referenced yeah. so many times. A lot times. of people read it in school. Yeah, like last year I was like, okay, I need to read 1984. Like I've heard it referenced so many times, I yeah. need to actually read it, and I did. And then I did the same thing. Animal Farm is very short. I think it was like, it was like one outdoor session, and I listened mm -hmm. to the whole thing all the way through. It was like three hours on an audiobook. Um, but I was like, oh, Cool. Okay, this makes way more sense now that I've like actually listened to the whole thing all the way through. So now I'm feeling a little more educated a bit. And I was like, oh, let me read up a little bit about George Orwell and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. I was because I had no, I didn't even have any context as like when he wrote it or yeah. what it was about. It was basically like about like Stalin, you know, Stalinist Russia. Yeah, I feel extremely thing. uneducated the fact that I've never um, studied that or read it. But I'm not going to tell anybody, so no one's going to find out. You haven't read like World War One kind of stuff, like World War One, World War Two, like all that. Oh no, no, no! I've never read Animal Farm. Oh, or I've never okay. studied Animal Farm. No, no, okay. I listened to, I listened to Dan, uh, um, Dan Carlin's. Um, uh, oh yeah, like one Dan Carlin podcast is longer than. No, I, I listened Farm. to his entire <laughs> World War One series. Oh my gosh. That was like 26 That's hours. That's like a master class. Yeah, it was um, Countdown yeah. to a Blueprint for Armageddon. Yeah, is what they yeah. called it. You would like Animal Farm. It's a very easy read. Yeah, I'm sure I would. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Um, yeah, anyway, so I did that. So that was cool. Um, did lots of tree work. So again, I was like, I was sick, but not 100% sick all the time. Like my fatigue would like kind of come and go. Are you ever too sick to and go to not cut down trees though? Maybe for like I feel like you'd be like, period? all right, like, Joseph, push, push me over to that tree. Like if I'm like, if if I feel like I'm not going to be Hand sick. Hand me my chainsaw, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, if I feel like I'm not going to be safe or attentive, I will not do like that kind of stuff. Of course. But if I'm just like, uh, I'm feeling kind of groggy, I'll like, it's good for me to move my body. You know what I mean? Like yeah. physically, mentally, especially like I'm cooped up in the house. I'm not driving to work. I'm not seeing other people. Like I need to do something else. I love so being I just, cooped like, up in the house. See, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fine for like a little bit, but like, no, I got to like change my scenery and all that kind of stuff. So did lots of tree work. I did a lot of woodworking too, you know, organizing, doing my French cleats. I've been talking about that for forever. I just kept on going. Did my whole, my whole wall, my walls are now French cleats. Just went, just kept going. I still don't know what you're talking about, but you'll need to show me a picture at some Didn't point. Didn't I show some picture? I think I put the pictures and then we put them in the video. I don't know if I ever actually showed oh, no. you. I'll show you after the fact. I don't but watch this. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I don't go back and watch this either. Um, anyway, but what well, was really cool and this, then then I'll be done. Um, so you know what I've talked about Norm Abram and the New Yankee Workshop. Oh God, right? yeah, that, yeah. You've, you've told me how inspired it was for yeah. you early, early on. So this is a PBS show. Some of you may be familiar with it, maybe not. The show was on for for like decades, um, and it was a big influence for me in like my early twenties, right before Goulet Pens started up. Um, not only did I love woodworking, but just like the educational style of that yeah. show was like very informative for me. I remember the first time I ever out. saw cable was my, my grandparents got cable before we did. Okay. And I remember seeing that show. It was like one of the first shows I saw on cable and huh. it, I just sat in front of it. It's just, it was like really relaxing. Yeah. It's very like evenly paced, very and, calm. And, that, and when I was a kid, like, yeah, I shouldn't have been able to pay attention to that. But yeah. He's got like that thick New England, there was like something, Boston there, accent. There was something about it that was just like really yeah. comf he's comforting. A, he's a very good teacher. But um, so for years, they they well they stopped the show in 2009 and i guess they've sort of aired it maybe here and there a little bit but i'm surprised it went that they've long they've had it i know i mean it was on for 21 years 21 seasons wow. yeah um that'll be my fun fact for today's oh, okay, the there you go. workshop so i won't tease too much oh. but um so i really got into it sort of as you know rachel and i graduated got married in 2006 so I discovered we didn't have cable i like literally got it on pbs on rabbit ears and it was like 
on a Saturday, we got like three channels on rabbit ears. So in like a Saturday morning, it was like golf, some kind of like infomercial and like New Yankee Workshop would have been playing. So I like got into New Yankee Workshop and this is like, this was before like DVR and all that kind of stuff. It was like, I had to be there at like 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And I eventually got it to where we like had a VHS and we recorded it, you know, this sounds like it was forever ago. Like there was better technology, we were just broke. <laughs> so I literally had my parents hand me down television that was from 1984. And it was like super old and grainy. Like we would try to watch golf cause there was literally nothing else on. And they would like hit the ball into the sky and you couldn't even see the ball. It was so grainy. And I was like, well, this is limiting wow. in its uh, enjoyment. So, but I watched the Nanga workshop and it was like, it, that inspired me to do the woodworking and start the pen making. Yeah. And it just, that's what got it all going. Um, so I have wanted to like rewatch some of that stuff and I found it kind of here and there. They had it on like this old house.com behind a paywall for a bit. But anyway, all this to say, the guy, Russell Morash, who is the guy who produced the show, created a New Yankee Workshop YouTube channel and is now putting all of the old episodes on YouTube. So I just discovered this like two days ago. And, and how many of them have like, you watched? I've watched probably two dozen of these oh now. Oh my God. Because it's, there's a lot of them that I watched and loved, but there's a lot that I missed because I came in at like year 18 or something. So there's all these old episodes. Did you start from one? Well, I was only, I was, you just, it was uh, as they like, were live. No, 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 like, like right now. Are you like watching them all in oh, order or are you just kind of skipping around? Um, I don't think they've uploaded all of them yet. Oh, okay. And so there's some that they're still kind of putting on and they seem to be kind of uploading them in somewhat of a random order. So no, I'm not going like super sequential because there's not really a story no. to them per se, um, but I'm just watching them and I'm just like, man, it's just, it's nostalgic, but it's also like just inspiring and all that. So here I am like kind of sick, kind of quarantined, working in my shop watching like playing like vintage video games from 20 years and watching the workshop i'm like i'm in a really just interesting headspace right now um but just being very feeling very grateful oh it's just inspiring like i yeah. watch i watch so much stuff like on youtube and it's like everything is so like youtube -y yeah now or like podcasts you like everything is so algorithmic and formulated that i feel like and it's all like overblown and sensational and all that and it's like we do we, we do a little bit we play up a little bit but we're not as bad as most of yeah, the stuff. Yeah, I mean, stuff. You know, we, we try to make appealing thumbnails for our images and stuff, but like, yeah. we're not doing anything super we're unlike still, what we started out doing. Yeah, but it kind of like watching Norm Avram and just like how, again, like kind of soothing. He's kind of mm -hmm. like Bob Ross a yeah. little bit. Yes. He's like the Bob Ross. That was the vibe I got. Yeah, like he did this for so many years. He was on This Old House for 43 years and he just like never overplayed it. Just he knew his craft. He was just calm, he would teach well, and he just was consistent. And I was like, that's so refreshing. Yeah. With all the, you know, looking at Logan Paul jumping in freaking wrestling rings and all, I'm just like, I'm just kind of sick of all that. Yeah. Like, I don't need more stimulation. Oh no. At this point, <laughs> like, I'm kind of sick of that, you know? And so, I don't know, it's kind of re-inspired me a little bit. And it's like, okay, we're shooting some videos this week. And I'm like, yeah, let me just like focus on like really solid education, really solid just stuff like we did when we first got into. Stuff that's gonna thing. be, like, stuff that's gonna kind of stand the test of time, hopefully. Yeah, like I feel like at some point where like stuff is gonna get so sensationalized and then like people are gonna get kind of sick of it and kind of want to a true back. Yeah. You know, and it's like, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. I could see us running. I think, think of us like we're doing this 13 years now. I'm like, if you've got like a PBS show that's running like 13 years, 20 years, whatever, I'm like, I could see us being that, you know, just kind of doing any, our with, thing. Yeah, with any luck. Yeah. Like, yeah, okay. We probably could be bigger, more sensational, or if we wanted to. Yeah, but, like, but then we wouldn't be as. Yeah, kind of like. The, kinda you'd be sacrificing be kind of your genuine self a little bit. Yeah, I don't want to be like, you think about like the DIY type shows on like TLC and stuff like that, House Hunters and all these types of things. TL, that's like the learning that's channel. That's like turning it turning it all the way up to 11 yeah. on the drama front. And then you have like the Norm Abram types who yeah. are just like, nope, it's just this is just woodworking. Yeah. Like here's the information. I wonder if someone solid. like could could someone start off with a program like that and be successful in this day and age? In a television format? I don't think so. No. But on a YouTube like sure. Why not? Yeah, I will. Yeah, it wouldn't be like the number one channel, but you could. I mean, that's kind of what we. I will say that 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 channel I told you about primitive technology with that Australian guy. That yeah, he doesn't even talk. Yeah, like just, he has subtitles. He goes out. He builds a wattle and daub hut and talks you through it. 
slowly. Yeah. Like, I love that. I would much them. rather prefer watching something like that than some quick cut, super stimulating, you know, I don't know. Sometimes you just want to kind of yeah. chill out and absorb some information. I think the, the key is just be true to yourself. Yeah. Well, I feel like we're doing that, if anything else. Well, for better or worse, yeah, you're getting the authentic us. But yep. Anyway, so I'll have my fun fact at the end here, talking a little bit about Norm Abram. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much what I've been up to. Sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Now, a quick company updates, and then we'll wrap things up. All right. I don't have a whole lot to update because I'm still kind of getting back into the swing of things here. But... We do have a couple of videos that we've launched since we last did our pen cast. We have the Pilot E95S, which you talked about. I did, which yeah. Which is a uh, solid pen, very I, solid pen. I still have no memory of recording that video. <laughs> it's so funny. I, yeah. We shot, the, we shot a batch of videos together in like November. And then we had, you know, all organized in our software and stuff. Because we, we, we try to batch these things and we'll schedule them out and all that for, not the pen cast, but some of our other videos. And like literally we had them scheduled out and Drew was like, I checked some of these things off. He's I was like, like, Brian, I don't I, think I did this one. I think I accidentally checked them off. I don't think I actually recorded this. And Brian's like, like, well, you said I'm you did. I'm sure you did. <laughs> you checked this. I'm like, I don't, I think that was a mistake. I don't think I actually did. <laughs> so we had to go back and talk to our editor. He's like, no, no, we've got that footage. Yeah, Drew, you definitely shot it. Like, and Drew's like, I literally don't remember what and I, I shot I thought it would all. come back to me when I actually <laughs> saw the footage because he sent it to me for approval. And I'm, I'm watching, like, I. Who, who is this? I didn't. That's not me. I to didn't. Be fair, to be fair, Drew shot five videos in one shot, and I it, and I didn't bring like a change of shirt. So you're gonna see that corgi <laughs> shirt in like five different. <laughs> well, they'll so, be spaced out. You know. I mean, so if there was good. a shirt to repeat, I'm glad that that's the corgi one. shirt made yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's how it goes sometimes. You know, oh. we gotta we gotta get it done where we can. Um, and then I got a video out that I already mentioned on the All Star. Um, we were able to get some samples ahead of time, so I did get this shot in advance um, for the lilac and the petrol. So. Definitely check that out because they they look really good. I'm really happy with those colors. All right, and then we can go ahead and wrap this thing up. <clears throat> so I want to thank everybody for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing in the comments. Um, ask us questions so that we can continue to answer them, even if about your names. Um, you can check out gulepens.com for fountain pen ink, paper, and pens. That's the other thing we sell. Um, like and subscribe, YouTube, Instagram, all those things. You know what? I think from now on we should we should mention our email address after the feedback section. Oh, that would be or after the question section. Yeah, because okay. there I still get a lot of comments. Be like, how do you how do you ask questions? Cool. And cool. most people aren't listening at this point. Awesome. Thanks for telling me that at the very end. I meant to earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't I copy it while I'm here? <laughs> I'm going to copy this in my notes and I'm going to move it up. I'm like, what? I was like, are you people not listening? I'm like, oh, wait, no. This oh, is like say it. at the two hour point. We already, we always yeah, tell our email well, address. Yeah, we shouldn't make people endure <laughs> like all of this, you know, but. Like, I would ask a question, but I don't know how. We'll, we'll listen for two hours and then you'll know. We don't actually want your feedback. We just want to <laughs> go back and say, well, we did give you an email address. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, there we go. That's what we got. All right, you ready for my fun fact? Yeah, okay. as long as it's not about math. Um, there's some numbers, but no math. In Great. Those. Um, so, actually, kind of like wrote it out. Okay. Uh, so New Yankee Workshop, very influential show for me. It first aired in 1989, and it ran for 21 seasons until it was canceled in 2000. That was the year Batman came out. There you go. Uh, the show still had funding after 284 episodes, but. Norm Abram basically just decided that the show had accomplished all that he set out to do. And uh, he just wanted to spend some more time with his family. So he pretty much like retired from the show. All right. Um, but he was also doing This Old House, which is arguably a way more popular and well-known show. I don't know what that show is. Is that um, more woodworking? It's a famous PBS show. Well, they would basically go, there was some woodworking, but they would go and basically like fix up an old house. So oh, so this like, is like the original Fixer Upper reality show. It was the OG like Fixer Upper show. Oh, dang. Yeah. So, I mean, that was on from, I think, like 1979 or 1980 or something like that. Oh, man. It's been on for over a long time. Okay. So, anyway, if you're familiar with this old house, you would, if you saw it, you'd probably be like, oh, I've seen this. Like, it's familiar. Uh, but they show like plumbing and painting and landscaping. And so, they basically, huh. t they take a project of a house of sorts every season and they go and they just like fix it all up and they have a whole- Oh, so it's not a different house per episode? Uh, no, it's like they take a whole house, a whole project and they work on the whole thing through the season. Oh, wow. But they'll, you know, have different parts that are like landscaping related or painting or plumbing or foundation or carpentry or whatever. And they have like master 
craftspeople of whatever trade, and Norm Abram was the carpenter on this on this show. So anyway, Norm Abram, um, let's see here. So uh, yeah, I mentioned like like all the all the New Yankee Workshop episodes were previously behind a paywall with this old house, which I did subscribe to for a little bit, um, but it was kind of clunky, and I'm glad they didn't do it. And then they had like newyankee.com, but it wasn't until January 13th of this year. So literally just my timing was great. Um, when Russell Morash, the pr producer of New Yankee Workshop and this old house um, announced that he would be posting the entire New Yankee Workshop catalog onto YouTube for us all to enjoy. Um, and it's just interesting. I was looking like, how did this all happen? Like, so Russell Morash, actually the, the, the workshop that you see Norm working in, which I always thought was like his workshop, it's actually not. It's Russell. It's Russell's workshop. It's like in his backyard, and so he's the producer of the show. He discovered Norm because Norm was a carpenter, and was like hired as a contractor to work on something like in Russell's house or whatever. And he was so taken with the way that he like how efficiently he worked and how little scrap that he had left over, just because he was so like thoughtful and efficient with how he worked, that he like asked him more about it and ended up having him consult on this new show that he was doing the the this old house and then through his experience there and seeing how good of a teacher he was he then gave him his own show new yankee oh workshop. so new yankee workshop was after was this old birth house. out yeah yeah it was like 10 years later oh, okay. yeah so he consulted on he would continue to do contracting and he consulted on this old house um but anyway, is is so. norm abram still alive he is. Yeah. Oh. He's 73, I think, at this All point. All right. Yeah. So some fun, some more fun facts here. So uh, Russell discovered Norm in 1979, and then he worked on this old house for 43 years, just retiring this past October. So he was like 73, still working on that show, and just retired. So uh, I thought that was kind of neat. Very heartwarming as well. So I can't, I can't understate how impactful that the discovery of Norm Abrams and that show, New Yankee Workshop, was specifically to me in my early 20s. Uh, not only has it impacted my personal passion for craftsmanship and woodworking, uh, but in content-based education uh, that's had a massive impact on the way that I started the Goulet Pens YouTube channel back in 2010. So, I mean, literally, like, as he was retiring from the Yankee Workshop is when we started Goulet Pens, and then I started producing my own videos. Very much felt like a sort of a passing of the torch, so to speak. Um, so I owe Norm a huge thank you. And if you're watching this video and our channel, and there's a debt of gratitude that I think we all owe Norm and Russ and everybody involved in making that show, um, because it definitely helped inspire me and provided a roadmap for what enthusiast-driven content-based content -based education could look like in the fountain pen world. So well, that's my little thank homage you, to Norm. Norm. I wouldn't yeah. be here then yeah. without Norm. It's, it, was, it, was, it was an example of what could be done. You know, Not the only one, there were other influences that I had, but certainly that was a catalyst of inspiration and gave me just like a very, just like a benchmark of like, you know, same thing with like kind of Bob Ross and like these types of things, like just seeing people really good at their craft and just presenting it in a very non-sensational fashion, but just really reliably, really consistently, I was really inspired by that. That actually, it, it, you know, it, in bringing up a comparison to Bob, Bob Ross, it's, it's comforting to know that the catalog of New Yankee Workshop, it has a better custodian than Bob Ross's. Yeah, um, his story is a little, little more tragic. A little more tragic. But at least, at least, New Yankee Workshop is still in good hands and is. Yeah. Um, seems, seems to, be, seems to like have a good custodian. Pretty, pretty and advocate. good people. Just, yeah. Just no drama. Like there's yeah. just no drama in the production, in the story behind it, the show at all. It's just like, you know, it's just good people making shows for people that love woodworking and. I really dig that. Wholesome. So, very wholesome. So anyway, if you don't know what I'm talking about at all, or if you're like, oh my gosh, I remember that show. It's now all on YouTube. So go check out the Yankee Workshop YouTube channel. You'll see what it's all about. I love his thick Boston accent because it's just- Do you have any family really members funny. with a solid New England accent? Oh yeah, like my parents are both from Connecticut. Like yeah. all my extended family I don't really, I don't really get it much from your parents. But, they don't have super thick accents, yeah. but a lot of my extended family, like especially because yeah. my parents moved down like 40 years ago. Yeah. But everybody who's still up there is it's pretty thick. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Lots of qu quarter and like, you know, what are you doing? <laughs> so like do these you, types of things. Maybe that's why it's comforting to you. It's a little comforting. Yeah. Just because <laughs> I'm like, OK, like it's it's not unfamiliar right. to me. You know, like I don't have family members with like thick southern accents. Mm. Like we're like the southern ones 
in our yeah. family, you know, but it's like the New Englanders, like yeah. that's in like French Canadian like accents. Like there's a lot of that happening yeah. in my extended family. So I'm used to much more of like the nasally, you know, kind of stuff. It's like a little familiar to me. Yeah, so, not my family. Yeah, it's... yeah. Uh, this is interesting. So yeah, go check it out. New Yankee Workshop. You'll see, you'll probably feel some like, oh yeah, I can sort of see where Brian like <laughs> carried some of this over, a little bit of that vibe. So anyway. Uh, that's all we got for you this week. Hope you all enjoyed number 77. We will catch you on the next one. Thanks, everybody. Right on. <laughs>